In biology, a hybrid is the offspring resulting from combining the qualities of two organisms of different breeds, varieties, or species through sexual reproduction. Hybrids are not always intermediates between their parents, but can sometimes grow larger or taller than either parent. Species are reproductively isolated by strong barriers to hybridization, which include genetic and morphological differences, differing times of fertility, mating behaviors, and physiological rejection of the developing embryo. The concept of a hybrid is interpreted differently depending on the specific field of study and who you ask. In genetics, the attention is focused on the number of chromosomes. In taxonomy, the branch of science concerned with classification, the key question is how closely related the parent species are. So for example, in Tabasco, Mexico, there are two different species of monkey that overlap in a roughly 12 mile hybrid zone, the black howler monkey and the mantle howler monkey, which are considered different species because of a difference in their DNA, such as having a different number of chromosomes. They are genetically distinct and exhibit differences in social behavior, but are able to reproduce and have viable hybrid offspring giving rise to a new species in the hybrid zone. It's interesting to note that both the mantle howler monkey and black howler monkey do not accept the new hybrid population back into either community, a sort of simian or monkey racism, and so the hybrids live in between in what primatologists call the hybrid zone. While there are genetic barriers against the hybridization process in nature, such as hybrid offspring having more illness, defects, social and other problems, it is much more common than people realize. Probably the most well-known example of a hybrid species is the liger. What is a liger, you ask? What's a liger? It's pretty much my favorite animal. It's like a lion and a tiger mixed. Bread for its skills and magic. I don't know about their magical skills, but the liger is a hybrid offspring of a male lion and a female tigress. The liger is distinct from the similar hybrid called Tigon, which is a male tiger and a female lioness. The liger is the largest known feline. They enjoy swimming, which is a characteristic of tigers, and are very social like lions. Notably, ligers typically grow larger than either parent species. One of the most fundamental questions about ligers, are they sterile? Can they reproduce? The answer is yes. One example was in the Munich Zoo, where a female liger gave birth to viable offspring, where the father was a lion and the mother was a liger. There have been numerous other cases of this, so despite what many people think, Female ligers are not sterile, but rather they are highly fertile. A female liger can reproduce with both a lion and tigers. On May 16th, three female liger cubs were born at the Novosibirsk Zoo. Their parents are a young pair, Lion Sam, or Samson, and liger Zita. This is the second time Zita has given birth. Last fall, the young ligress gave birth to a female cub named Kiara. That said, hybrid humans existed in prehistory. For example, Neanderthals and modern humans, or Cro-Magnon, interbred from 35,000 to about 28,000 years ago. Europeans have between 1 and 5% Neanderthal genetics, while the percentage is even greater in East Asians. Sub-Saharan Africans have a trace amount of Neanderthal DNA, even though no Neanderthal has ever been found in Sub-Saharan Africa. The reason is because after hybridization in Europe, about 30,000 years ago, hybridized Europeans entered into Africa and interbred with an archaic ghost species, which got its name because it's only been detected genetically in the DNA of people from Sub-Saharan Africa and has not yet been identified in the fossil record. So modern Africans are a hybrid race of the ghost species which I suspect is Homo erectus, or another very archaic hominin, and Europeans who already had interbred with Neanderthal. 
In other words, there absolutely and conclusively was no out of Africa in the sense of sub-Saharan African people with dark skin leaving Africa and magically mutating into Asians and then Caucasians. This obsolete hypothesis will go down in history as a bigger fraud than the Piltdown Man, where a baboon's jaw was glued onto a human skull and displayed in the British Museum for over 40 years as a missing link. Instead, the first fully modern human, which is Cro-Magnon, which populated Western Europe and Northern Africa about 35,000 years ago, entered Sub-Saharan and Western Africa and interbred with an archaic hominin and this gave rise to modern Sub-Saharan Africans that never left Africa, since these genetics cannot be found anywhere else in the world. Caucasians and East Asians, for example, do not have sickle cell anemia, a disease strictly attributed to Sub-Saharan Africans, thought to have been brought about as a survival mechanism against malaria, as malaria does not develop in people with mild cases of sickle cell. There are other human biological variations between races, from the different number of vertebrae between populations, some having an extra rib, and even differences in dentation, meaning teeth. There are subtle differences, such as in earwax, as silly as that sounds, but it's taught in anthropology classrooms, and other variations that are no longer taught, such as genetic variation in IQ and behavior. Of course, the most obvious indicator of hybridization in humanity is the mystery surrounding Rh negative blood, which is neither a good nor a bad thing, but an immune response, a natural biological barrier where the body of an Rh negative mother attacks and tries to reject her own unborn baby, which could result in death if it were not for modern medical intervention, where the administration of a shot prevents a fatality. If humanity all evolved from the same African ancestor, the blood would be compatible, but it's not. This is why we see this phenomenon, a physiological rejection of developing embryo, as we see it in other hybridization scenarios with other animal species. Being Marxist or communist or part of an egalitarian movement does not change biological reality. Either does censorship, name-calling, or obsessive political correctness. Scientific correctness does not care about political correctness. In Japan, people often ask each other what their blood type is before dating, the same way that in the West people ask each other what astrological sign they are. According to a 2016 study of 3,355 Japanese people, 99% knew their blood type. And ironically, I don't know my own blood type, but in my case it's by choice, as in my line of research, not knowing has helped to keep my work objective and unbiased. In Japan, blood types are considered an important indicator of a person's personality, and most of the Japanese population is type A. People with this blood type are described primarily as well organized. They are said to like to keep things neat, but can be stubborn and get stressed out easily, while valuing harmony in others. Agriculturalists are the root of blood type A, and it's been said that working collaboratively on farms develop these blood type personality traits. Blood type O is often described as optimistic, outgoing, having leadership abilities, and good at setting the mood for groups of people. They don't sweat the little things, a trait that is said to get under the skin of more sensitive A-types. They are known often for showing up late to events, but also incredibly resilient and flexible, enabling them to roll with the punches. Blood type B is generally described as having a tendency to be selfish, but on the other hand, also known and respected for their unique creativity. Blood type B has a strong sense of curiosity, but at the same time loses interest easily. Though there are a lot of positives to B types, people tend to focus on the negative aspects of sometimes being loners, which is attributed historically to ancestors that were nomadic, meaning people that roamed from place to place. 
Blood type AB is a hybrid of A and B, with traits from two different personalities mixed together. They're often seen as dual natured and complicated. For example, they're shy like A types, but can also be outgoing like type B. Blood type AB is the rarest in Japan and in many other parts of the world, and the stereotype that goes with it is that AB people are eccentric. Japan, incidentally, has undergone a genetic and racial shift in its history, as prior to being populated by the current, mostly East Asian phenotype, it was primarily inhabited by the ancestors of the current minority Ainu population, who have many Caucasian features, such as facial hair. Prior to the Ainu, we have the Jomon period in Japanese prehistory, dating back to over 14,000 years ago, by what clearly was a Caucasoid type of people. Anthropologists called them Asiatic Caucasoids because they had facial features and body hair that seemed more European than Asian. In fact, the Ainu are thought to be a remnant of a very ancient population that was once widespread in the Old World. This is 28,000 years from China. What we know of these early Asians is based on just a few skulls. It's one of the earliest anatomically modern Homo sapiens in Asia. One of them is a 28,000-year-old specimen from China, which looks very much like the 9,000-year-old spirit caveman. And there are some marked similarities in the facial architecture. Tremendous similarity in the shapes of the eye orbits in the sense that they're both somewhat rectangular, similar inner orbital distance, overall appearance of the orbits, the shape of the nose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But many of the features, including mm -hmm. the very heavy mandible and the prominent, prominent mm -hmm. symphysis here, those features are, mm -hmm. are very much the same. Hiroshi Oshima, the former Japanese ambassador to nationalist Germany, believe that the noble caste in Japan, the Daimo and the Samurai, were descended from gods of celestial origin, which is similar to the German National Socialist's own belief that the Nordic race did not evolve, but came directly down from heaven to settle on the Atlantic continent. I recently made a video presentation called Atlantis and Antediluvian Anthropology, and included a link in the description if you haven't seen it yet and would like to. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift. Thank you to those who support me on Patreon. I'm very grateful and appreciate the support I've been receiving. There should be a link below for those who are interested. I also greatly appreciate anyone that shares these videos. So thank you. Please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell for updates. I also added links in the description to my social media accounts on Twitter and my Facebook group and page where you can post questions or make requests for future video topics. I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comments section below. Please have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you again soon. Order of the Eastern Star is a Masonic organization with over 500,000 members, spanning 21 countries, based on the stories of the Bible. Their teachings revolve around five biblical heroines, Ada, Ruth, Esther, Martha, and Electa. Each of these female characters is assigned items of symbolic value, such as a sword and veil, a sheaf of barley, a crown and scepter, a chalice, and a broken column. Each also represents a virtue, such as obedience to duty, religious principles, loyalty, endurance in trial, and endurance in persecution. Of course, these five characters, virtues, and colors are all expressed in their emblem of a five-pointed star, with the white ray of the star pointing downwards. Surrounding the center pentagon in the emblem are the letters F-A-T-A-L, and what they stand for is a guarded secret of the order given only to its members. 
there's some speculation that it stands for, quote, fairest among thousands, altogether lovely. However, I would suggest that is only for public consumption and the true meaning is revealed through a Kabbalistic interpretation, much in the same way that the famous G in the square and compass symbol is publicly regarded as standing for God or Grand Architect, but in esoteric context stands for the seventh letter of the alphabet, which is of course the number seven, alluding to the days of creation, the number of celestial gods, meaning the five visible planets plus the sun and the moon, but in the Eastern philosophy represents the seven chakras and is closely tied in with tantric practices and distribution of prana, chi, or vril from the base or root chakra up into the crown where the third eye is located and occult vision is activated, such as clairvoyance the faculty of perceiving things or events in the future or beyond normal sensory contact. The central point of the ceremony, the climax of our effort, is the definite admission into the order. The point at which a certain center or chakra is opened, a certain potentiality of power given. All that precedes that in the ceremony is of the nature of preparation for that point. All that follows it is in the nature of explanation of what has been done, or of exhortation as to how the power can be best developed and used. This third eye is the true esoteric, deeper meaning behind the eye symbolism. And please notice how I said deeper esoteric meaning as there are several valid interpretations, such as the Phoenician or Hebrew letter Ein, whose position in the alphabet is 16, which in numerology, you add the digits until it reduces to a number between one and nine. So 16 becomes one plus six, giving us seven. In Gematria, it has a numeric value of 70, which also reduces to seven. And before there was such thing as a Hebrew alphabet, in very ancient times, the pictographic representation of the Ein resembled the image of an eye. So while Paleo-Hebrew meaning of the eye symbol is the pictograph of the eye, and not only means eye, but to see, to understand, in a Gnostic context. Paleo just means old or ancient. So when I say Paleo-Hebrew, I essentially mean Phoenician which is a term that comes from the Greek word phoinos, meaning blood red, which can allude to the red ochre paint the ancient Mediterranean culture applied to their white skin, from the ancient Minoans 4,000 years ago to the red-painted Egyptian pharaohs, a topic I already covered in several prior videos. The Phoenician Ein, incidentally, is the origin of the Greek and Latin or Roman O, so when you see occult-backed celebrities making circles with their fingers and placing it around their eye, they're making the letter symbol O around their eye. This pictographic writing predates the Phoenician alphabet and is the origin of the Ein, which later became the O, which is the 15th letter of the English alphabet. And 1 plus 5 gives us 6, which is the number of points on the star known as a hexagram and also as the Seal of Solomon, which is also representative of ancient tantric rituals, expressed by the joining of two opposed triangles, the famous thesis of Hermes Trismegistus, as above, so below. The triangle pointing up is an alchemical sign for fire, and the one pointing down for water, together symbolic of the principle of cosmic unity. It is for this reason that the number six Pythagoras connected with the planet Venus, goddess of love, intuition, divine wisdom, and gnosis. In Latin, the hexagram is actually called sexagram, and rightfully so, but its occult significance has been lost, at least publicly, especially by those who the mainstream media considers experts on the subject. Today we're going to be giving a little bit of uh, history and insight into the Star of David symbol. Um, it's known in Hebrew as the Magen David, which literally means the Shield of David. And the truth is that the interlocking symmetrical triangle was a common symbol 
um, in the East, in the, in the ancient world. The hexagram also had, was, was very common in Shinto belief in Japan and an ast astrological figure in Persia. The history of the Star of David itself, nobody's really quite sure where it, or, where it originated or how it became like such a prominent identifiable symbol with, with Judaism. Most of us realize this is one of the most widely recognized symbols in all of Jewish culture. Uh, and what we want to look at tonight is the origins of such a symbol and where it might come from. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't any real direct reference to the Jewish star or the Magen David in any of our biblical literature or Talmudic literature, even in our Kabbalistic and Midrashic literature. And even the famous uh, Jewish philosopher and uh, academic, Gershom Sholem, uh, who passed away in 1982, uh, was a scholar who insisted that the Magen David was not a Jewish symbol at all. And he refused to accept the idea that there was any connection between the Star of David, the Magen David, and Judaism uh, to speak of. The chief architect of the Temple of Solomon in the Old Testament was Hiram Abiff in 966 BC, which is an integral part of Freemasonry, providing everything from the layout of the lodge room with its pillars to the rituals and foundation of the higher degrees. That said, Hiram Abiff was a Phoenician from the city of Tyre, a Phoenician city. Well, his father was from Tyre and his mother from a Hebrew tribe of Nephtali occupying what is now northern Israel beside the Sea of Galilee. This is also near Baalbek, the ancient Phoenician city located in what is now modern-day Lebanon, named after Baal, the Phoenician deity, which literally translates into Lord, but in this context describes the bearded god holding a thunderbolt, sometimes called Hadad in Canaanite and Mesopotamian religions. In Greek and Roman times, Baalbek was also known as Heliopolis, which is Greek for Sun City. So whenever you hear about this thunder god, which went by many names, Hadad, Indra, Jupiter, Zeus, Thor, Marduk, or in Egypt he was Amun, keep in mind that he's extremely close to the sun god. And while this may get a little bit confusing for some, is almost interchangeable with the sun. So, for example, in Egypt, we have Amun-Ra, where Ra is the sun and Amun is Jupiter, but they combine them into one. But in most cases, they are father and son. And this is true of all solar religions and, by extension, all major world religions. The astrotheological reason for this close relationship is that at night, when the sun goes down, it is Jupiter that traverses the path of the ecliptic over a 12-year cycle, passing the 12 houses of the zodiac over its 12-year orbit around the sun, which is why the zodiac is divided into 12, why there are 12 months, 12 astrological ages to Plato's great year, which is a 25,900-year cycle, why there are 12 months in a year, 12 inches in a foot, etc. That said, it is in the city of Balbic that we find the Temple of Jupiter, as well as swastika symbols associated with the solar cults, for example, on this Phoenician artifact, as well as the Seal of Solomon. In fact, we see these two symbols together in many places around the world, something not taught anymore in post-World War II universities, but very visible in places like Lalibela, Ethiopia, where swastikas are carved right into the stone churches and hexagram stars are also to be found inside or in places like India on temples of worship, or on this ancient mosaic from Paphos on the Mediterranean island of Cyprus, which was also part of ancient Phoenicia. Of course, these two ancient symbols also appear together on certain coins, which is a very little known fact due to the corruption and propaganda following World War II, and hints at a reality that will absolutely shock anyone who knew the truth which at this time is not accurately discussed anywhere online by anyone, 
especially the people who post about this and think they know what they're talking about, but in actuality are being used as tools by the same globalist bankers that they think they are combating. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift. I'd like to thank those who support me on Patreon. There should be a link below for those who are interested. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. I also want to extend my gratitude to anyone that shares these videos as I rely on word of mouth. Please remember to hit the like button and to subscribe for updates. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comment section. So please leave a comment for me below. Please have a wonderful week and I hope to see you again soon. Once upon a time, long ago, before the gods and demigods of our ancestors in the homeland, before Julius Caesar governed in Rome, when there were no church bells calling to the fair, and the books of the Bible were not yet written, there prevailed a golden goddess over skies and earth. All people belonged to the sun and worshipped its sunshine. The sun warms up the earth when the goddess combs over the earth with her golden rays of hair as she does always at midday. Humans forgot that it is like that because it is written nowhere in the Bible, but it is like that. There came a day when humans no longer admired the sun goddess. That insulted her, but nevertheless, she didn't want to remove the necessary rays from humans so long as it would give warmth to their hearts. If the rays should cool off, however, the goddess would turn away and would give her warming light to another world which had earned it more. This is what the sun goddess announced before a crowd of seven leading knights, and she raised these to be her eternal servants. The knights were to come together and give themselves a secret title that only they could recognize. They should build a magnificent castle then, with four turrets after the directions of the wind, and an inner court of special place. In the center of the special place, a base was to stand, and beside it, a telus gate. Against this telus gate, climbing roses should be planted, and soon they would adorn it beautifully. In addition, the knight should create a golden figure, formed after the goddess's instruction. Through this figure, she would speak to her knights. If they put the figure up at midday on its base in the center of the special place in the court. The knights did everything completely and exactly, just as the sun goddess had instructed them. For the first time, the golden figure was set up at midday in the center of the courtyard, and the goddess spoke to them there with these words. I greet you, my noble lonely knights. Thus I call you, because you will be lonely, because the eternal ones are always lonely. Such are you. While other humans of this earth die and are pulled into far regions, either good or bad, to you such dying is not. If you need a new body, because the old is used up, then I give you a new. You must live as humans on this earth from now until at least one times 777 years, or it may however also be twice or three times this time interval. The years will seem eternal and at the same time lonely, knights of the demigod light. I now give you your orders. 777 years shall be given to the earth and its inhabitants starting now. The golden figure by which I speak to you will guard the earth for so long. Your castle will be purged with time, and humans will not see anything but rubble. For you, however, nothing is destroyed. It lives in intact splendor. For the mortal, it will be invisible. The sound splendor of your castle will not be visible for them. It is, however, needful for you to become at any time visible, to do palpable things if it is needed. Since you are now only a few, a larger crowd of lonely knights is necessary, in order that your order may be quite fulfilled. It is for you to select from among the daughters of humans the most beautiful and noble, and to sleep with them for seven days and seven nights without break. Thus shall you transfer your immortality to these your wives. 
the children who you witness with them will not be immediately eternal, but I will give this power to them. Now I want you to go forth for the first seven years. One goes into northern Germany and takes himself a woman there. One goes into northern Italy and takes himself a woman there. One goes to France and takes himself a woman there. One goes into southern Italy and takes himself a woman there. One goes to Spain and takes himself a woman there. One goes to Hungary and takes himself a woman there. One remains in southern Germany, in Austria, and takes himself a woman here. Send your first son and your first daughter to this, your castle. The golden figure will speak through me and instruct them all further. Thus, the mystery crowd of the eternal lonely nights was formed over time. That legend of the lonely nights around a castle which lies very hidden, inaccessible to the uninitiated, was part of nationalist German mysticism, which was influenced by Templarism. But who were the German Templars? The Temple Society is a German Protestant sect with roots in the Pietist movement of the Lutheran Church. Pietism is a movement that combines biblical doctrine with the reformed emphasis on individual piety. In spiritual terminology, piety is a virtue which may include religious devotion, spirituality, and humility, which originated in Germany in the late 17th century. Their members refer to themselves as Templars. Although the movement started exclusively within Lutheranism, it had a tremendous impact on Protestantism worldwide spreading first to Switzerland, Scandinavia, and the Baltics, and the rest of Europe, then taken to North America, primarily by German and Scandinavian immigrants. There, it influenced Protestants of other ethnic backgrounds, contributing to the 18th century foundation of evangelicalism, a movement within Protestantism that today has some 300 million followers. The Templars were expelled from the Lutheran Church in 1858 because of their millennial beliefs. Millennialism is a word that comes from the Latin millennialis, which means containing a thousand, and is the belief of a coming transformation of society after which all things will be changed, usually coming about after major cataclysms or other apocalyptical events. The word Templar is derived from concepts in the Bible, where every person and the community are seen as temples in which God's Spirit dwells. The Temple Society was founded by two men, Christoph Hoffmann, who was chairman of a German congregation of the Moravian Church, also called the Unitas Fratrum, Latin for Unity of the Brethren, one of the oldest Protestant denominations in the world dating back to the Bohemian Reformation of the 15th century, founded in the Kingdom of Bohemia. The other was George David Hardegg, who in 1868 purchased land at the foot of Mount Carmel, a coastal mountain range in northern Israel stretching from the Mediterranean Sea towards the southeast, where Israel's third largest city, called Haifa, is located. At the time, Haifa had a population of 4,000 Arabs, and the Templars are credited today with the development of the city, with religious colonies spreading congregations to Jaffa, Jerusalem, and Sorona, where they established a regular coach service between Haifa and other cities, promoting tourism, making important contributions to road construction, and establishing a lot of agriculture, for example, the colony's oranges were the first to carry the Jaffa Orange brand, one of the better known agricultural brands in Europe, used to market Israeli oranges to this day. Their aim was to promote spiritual cooperation to advance the rebuilding of the temple in the Holy Land, then called Palestine, in the belief that this foundation will promote the second coming of Christ. In 1898, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany visited the colonies 
and initiated the formation of a society for the advancement of the German settlements in Palestine, enabling the settlers to acquire land for new settlements by offering them low-interest loans. Waves of pioneer settlers followed in 1902, 1903, 1906, and 1907, with Templar communities in what was then called Palestine, now numbering in the thousands. The houses they built can still be seen in Haifa and on part of what is now called Ben-Gurion Boulevard. There's been a growing interest in Israel about these German settlers, and an exhibition about them was organized in Tel Aviv back in 2006, where they are acknowledged as being the first to develop the land in modern times, and the government recognizes the contributions they made to things like early infrastructure. Fast forward to World War I and the events associated with it, such as the Balfour Declaration. And if you're not familiar with that, I've included a link in the description to a video I did on the subject. When the British Army conquered the Holy Land at the end of 1917, matters started to change for the German Templars. In July and August of 1918, the British sent almost a thousand Templars to an internment camp near Cairo in Egypt. In April 1920, most were deported to Germany. All the property of the Templars of enemy nationality, meaning Germans, was taken into public custodianship. With the establishment of a regular British administration in 1918, Templar property and livestock was seized, labeled as enemy property, and rented out with profits collected by the British. In April 1920, the Allies convened at the Conference of San Remo, agreeing on the British rule in Palestine. Fast forward to 1933 and the rise of the Nationalist Socialist government in Germany. Many of the Templars that weren't deported officially joined the Nationalist German Party, who opened a branch in Haifa in 1934, followed by another one in Jaffa. At the time, it was not uncommon to see a Nationalist Socialist parade in the streets of Tel Aviv, with flags and uniforms in full regalia. This image was from Jerusalem, and you can see the flags for yourself out in the open. Here's an article from 1938, which was published in the sixth year of the transfer agreement, where German Jews voluntarily went to transfer camps from 1933 to 1939 and were not only given a ride to the Holy Land on German ships, once they arrived they were given back a large portion of their assets, whether it be money or things like real estate, with another portion of it going to Jewish organizations which used it for various common goods and services. You can find out more about it online, such as articles called Transfer Agreement on Wikipedia, or Jewish websites where it's called the Havara Agreement. 100% available mainstream knowledge, even if it's ignored 100% by Hollywood and the controlled corporate media. The German camps were established to send people and their assets to Palestine by the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, something overlooked and left out by people like Steven Spielberg, but nonetheless part of history and factual reality. Live on Channel 5, this is the 10 o'clock news with Deborah Norville. Coming out revealing secret negotiation between the Nazis and the Zionists in 1933, which allowed German Jews and their assets to go to Palestine. American Jews marched calling for the boycott of all German exports. Jews throughout Europe echoed that call. So did Jews everywhere. But a group of Zionists at the same time was quietly negotiating an agreement with the Nazis to allow the immigration of German Jews and the transfer of their assets to Palestine. That deal, reported in August 1933, was the transfer agreement. Palestine, sparsely settled by Jews at the time, was radically changed as a result. I lived in Palestine from 1933 to 1936, and uh, we saw um, every week transports of German Jews coming to settle in Palestine. German Jewish settlement of Palestine was, for a time, official Nazi policy. These photos of Jewish life in Palestine, along with a lengthy text, appeared in 1934 in the Berlin paper Der Angry. A Nazi visits Palestine was the title of the multi-part series. A medal was struck by Goebbels in commemoration. On one side, the swastika. On the other, 
the Star of David. That said, the relations deteriorated between the German Templars that spent decades building the community there and other migrants that were in political alignment with the British, some of whom emigrated from places like Russia in alignment with Russian Bolsheviks, who were the Marxist origins of the communist revolution that killed tens of millions and then became the Soviet Union. The British ran what is now Israel from the end of the First World War, and by the time of the Second World War, decided that after nearly a century in Haifa, the German Templars needed to be kicked out, deporting them en masse to Germany. Many of the children of the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of Yiddish-speaking Germans who populated Palestine from 33 to 39 are unaware of this history and are also taught propaganda in their schools. Yiddish, by the way, is one of the dialects of Alemannic Germany that belongs to the High German group, like Swabian, from the region of Bavaria. For those familiar with my work, the term Swabia will sound familiar, as in New Swabia, or Neuschwabenland, an area of Antarctica named by nationalist Germany, a subject that I'll get into in much more detail in an upcoming video, with content never before disclosed publicly, not available by any other source, period. Which leads us to these coins, which I showed in my last video, which I'll leave a link to in the description, which was about ancient symbols, such as a swastika and what some call the Seal of Solomon, both symbols appearing together on the same coin, as they also often appear together on ancient Phoenician archaeological sites, or ancient structures in places like Lalibela, Ethiopia, that contain both the swastika carved into stone churches, as well as the Seal of Solomon built by the Knights Templar. This is suppressed because it goes against the narrative pushed by modern post-World War II academia, media, Hollywood, as well as people who call themselves truthers that saturate social media with false information disseminated by the same globalist bankers that they claim to be united against. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift. I'd like to thank those who support me through Patreon.com. There should be a link below for those who are interested. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comment section. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon. A pendulum is a weight suspended from a fixed point so that it can swing freely back and forth. And it also makes for a good metaphor for the tendency of a situation to oscillate between one extreme and another. This is also similar to the way a swing moves back and forth, and when regarded in a historical context, can be compared to the way different time periods have tended to move in a cyclical manner, rather than progressing in a forward, linear march. The pendulum of life often swings until it reaches a tipping point, and then it shifts course and swings back in the other direction. This concept also seems to apply to the way religious organizations have functioned over time, such as with the Catholic Church, which at one time carried a very strict social policy, for example, during the Holy Inquisition, when a group of institutions within the Catholic Church made it its aim to combat religious dissent starting in the 12th century and what it called heresy, which resulted in the genocide of certain groups such as the Cathars. Cathar comes from the Greek word meaning pure ones, who were a Gnostic sect with followers that called themselves good Christians, but the Catholic Church did not recognize their belief as being Christian, and so they were often burned alive. During the late Middle Ages and early Renaissance, the concept and scope of the Inquisition significantly expanded in response to the Protestant Reformation which is an example of the religious pendulum swinging away from the authoritative control of the church to a degree of religious freedom where the Bible was translated and published into other European languages, such as French, English, and German, giving direct biblical access to the common people rather than dependency on the clergy, who were the only ones who could read Latin at the time. I'll include a link in the description to a video I did on the Protestant Reformation for those who are interested. 
This also resulted in what is called the Counter-Reformation, or Catholic Revival, which was a response to the Protestant Reformation, and the period when Europe underwent several decades of religious wars, expulsions, heresy trials, inquisitions, and the founding of new religious movements and orders. Such policies had long-lasting effects in European history, with exiles of Protestants continuing well into the 1700s. A man named Lorenzo Corsini became Pope Clement XII and led the Catholic Church from 1730 until 1740, during which time he banned Catholics from becoming Freemasons, a prohibition which lasted from 1738 until 1983, where any Catholics who publicly associated with or publicly supported Masonic organizations were excommunicated. Which brings us to the topic of today's episode, regarding a secret organization that came about from this band called the Oculists. The word oculist is basically the same in meaning as an optometrist, and the chosen profession used to disguise a secret order that was no longer permitted by the church, so continued by disguising their activities by publicly proclaiming a different activity. In the same way that alchemists publicly claimed to be trying to convert common metals into gold, but really working on other esoteric transmutations, the oculists chose the symbol of the eye doctor as a cover for their occult inner workings, which like other secretive orders, revolved around initiation to become a member. The master wears an amulet with a blue eye in the center. Before him, a candidate kneels in the candlelit room, surrounded by microscopes and surgical implements. The initiation has begun. The master places a piece of paper in front of the candidate and orders him to put on a pair of eyeglasses. Read, the master commands. The candidate squints, but it's an impossible task. The page is blank. The candidate is told not to panic. There is hope for his vision to improve. The master wipes the candidate's eye with a cloth and orders preparation for the surgery to commence. He selects a pair of tweezers from the table. The other members in attendance raise their candles. The master starts plucking hairs from the candidate's eyebrow. This is a ritualistic procedure, no flesh is cut, but these are symbolic actions out of which none are without meaning. The master assures the candidate. The candidate places his hand on the master's amulet. Try reading again, the master says, replacing the first page with another. This page is filled with handwritten text. Congratulations, brother, the members say. Now you can see. For more than 260 years, the contents of that page and the details of this ritual remained a secret. They were hidden in a coded manuscript, one of thousands produced by secret societies in the 18th and 19th centuries. At the peak of their power, these clandestine organizations, most notably the Freemasons, had hundreds of thousands of adherents, from colonial New York to imperial St. Petersburg. Their lodges were considered by some to be safe houses where free thinkers could explore everything from the laws of physics to the rights of man, to the nature of God, all hidden from the oppressive, authoritarian eyes of the church and state. But like the pendulum effect we discussed earlier, things do not remain static, they change, and organizations also change, ironically in directions often opposite to the very reason they were founded in the first place, where at one point in time, a secret society held meetings to protect and ensure freedom. At another point in time, those same organizations are infiltrated and subverted, used to eliminate the very liberty they swore to uphold. As for the symbolic site restoring ritual, it was actually by accident that brought it to light. It started with a 250-year-old coded manuscript 
that was recently deciphered by machine translation, which used algorithm software to unlock the mystery. My name is Kevin Knight. Uh, I'm at the Information Sciences Institute at the University of Southern California, and my area of research is natural language processing. So the Copial Cipher is a 100-page book and includes 75,000 characters, several hundred years old, written entirely in cipher. We had no idea what the book uh, said and no one had deciphered it up to this point. We used some automatic methods to cluster the letters, so we looked at groups of letters that behave similarly. We also have programs that can identify the language behind the text, and it gave a slight preference for German. One thing we noticed was that the Roman letters in the text all seem to have a similar behavior to one another. The first hypothesis that we had was that's the real code. Uh, in the end, it turned out that those Roman letters um, were the spaces between the words. And the first two words that we could see here in the German were ceremony of initiation. So that was very exciting because uh, we had no idea what the book was about until that point. And the next two words were secret section. Um, only later, after we cracked it, we found out it was a a document from a secret society uh, from the 1730s. Secret societies were kind of a craze in the 1730s. So this is a, opens up a window for people who study the history of ideas and the history of secret societies. The book has several parts, and uh, one part describes the rituals uh, that the society uses. But there's also a lot of um, political things at the end of the document. Written in German, the manuscript was detailing the initiation ceremony of the Oculus sect fixated on both the anatomy and symbolism of the eye. They focused on sight as a metaphor for knowledge. Centered in the town of Wolfenbüttel, Germany, on their crest, the oculists featured a cataract needle and three cats, which some surmise were symbolically used because they could see in near darkness, but the cats were also guarding a cage full of mice, watching over them. Their attitude was rather progressive compared to other male-only secret fraternities in that women could be oculus too. Starting on page 27 and continuing for the remaining 78 pages, the cipher detailed the rituals performed by the highest degrees of the Masonic order rites, unknown to ordinary Masons at the time. Nothing was omitted from the description of these top-level rituals, including the veneration of Hiram Abiff, builder of the great temple of Jerusalem, whose decomposed body became the alchemical emblem for turning something rotten into something miraculous and golden. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift. I would like to thank those who support me through patreon.com. There should be a link below for those who are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you. I also want to extend my gratitude to anyone who shares these videos as I rely on word of mouth. Please remember to hit the like button and subscribe for updates. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comment section, so please leave a comment below. Have a wonderful week, and I hope to see you again soon. In mythology, folklore, and religion, a trickster is a god, goddess, demigod, spirit, or sometimes even an animal, which exhibits a great degree of wisdom, occult, or secret knowledge, and uses it or plays tricks or otherwise disobeys normal rules and conventional behavior. These archetypal characters appear in the myths of many different cultures around the world. And I'll go ahead and take a chance and say every single culture, as the mystery behind this boundary crosser actually stems from a forgotten time in prehistory and was passed down from an ancient global civilization from which we all share various degrees of ancestry with. That said, tricksters not only bend or break rules, they're also considered thieves. Now, I got some pushback in the comments section of one of my recent videos called The Emerald Tablets of Hermes, or Toth. I'll leave a link in the description if you haven't seen it. And towards the beginning, I said that the deity Hermes, or Mercury, was the god of thieves, or protector of thieves. And the confusion this caused is the real reason for this video. It seems that people have a tendency to interpret the tricks, or stealing, as negative activities which go against mankind. 
But as I will try to articulate in today's episode, that's not necessarily the case. In Greek mythology, Prometheus is a titan and is also a trickster. He's what's known as a cultural hero, and in the context of mythology, a hero is defined as a character who changes the world through invention or discovery or who contributes to the creation of civilization itself. A typical cultural hero might be credited with the discovery of agriculture, music, or in the case of Prometheus, fire. This archetype is mirrored in many Native American mythologies and beliefs, where the coyote spirit stole fire from the gods and gave it to mankind. So the first point I want to make is the act of stealing in this context is beneficial to mankind. The second point I want to make is that fire in the occult and mystery schools does not mean the heat generated when you strike a match, but another type of fire that is associated with internal alchemy. Natives from the southeastern United States replaced the coyote with a rabbit hero, and Pacific Northwest native stories often feature a raven in this role, where the raven steals fire from his uncle the beaver and eventually gives it to humans. Again, I want to stress that despite what is taught in schools, if it's even taught at all, the context is not about how Homo erectus got fire and learned how to cook with it. We're talking about the fire that ignites the soul, that inspires fine art, that influences music, that's the trigger of new inventions or the divine spark of creativity that's associated with problem solving. So as with all religions, these myths should not be taken literally, but one must understand the underlying symbols. Fire is not just the flame, but the light that illuminates. And I'll come back to this a little later. In Norse and Germanic mythology, the god Odin steals the mead of poetry and is credited with the discovery of the runes. The poetic mead is a mythical beverage that's equated with divine inspiration, and whoever drinks it becomes a scholar, able to recite any information, and so wise that there are no questions that he cannot answer. In a literal sense, Mead is an alcoholic beverage created by fermenting honey with water, sometimes with various fruits, spices, grains, or hops. The alcoholic content ranges from 3.5% to more than 20%. But in the legend, Kavasir is a very wise god that traveled around teaching and spreading knowledge until some dwarves killed him and drained his blood, mixing it with honey, which resulted in the mead of poetry imbuing whoever drinks it with wisdom, leading to the introduction of poetry to mankind. Now, I hesitate to tell the story of how Odin stole the mead because of potential censorship issues, but let's just say that the precious liquid leaked from another god's rear end, and Odin gave it to those truly gifted in poetry. In the biblical context, the snake in the Garden of Eden story plays the role of the trickster. In Hebrew, the word nekash is used to identify the serpent that appears in Genesis, who is portrayed as a deceptive creature or trickster who cunningly promotes as good what God had forbidden. So keep in mind that the Bible was not written in English. It was translated and retranslated several times before it made it to English. So nekash is the serpent, the dragon, and Lucifer or light bearer. So this can be taken the same way that Prometheus was also a light bearer or light bringer as Prometheus from the view of mankind was the good guy who stole the fire and gave it to man and for this was punished by Zeus for his defiance against the gods. In Jewish mysticism we have something called the Zohar meaning radiance and is the foundational work of the Kabbalah, which is at the core of many, if not all, secret societies, including those of pre-World War II Germany, including the Vril Society. 
The teachings include commentary of the mystical aspects of the Torah, which is the first part of the Bible, called the Old Testament, where we find Genesis and the Garden of Eden story. The Zohar contains scriptural interpretations specifically to do with the serpent, or the Lucifer character, which are left out of modern versions of the Bible. The word Lucifer, the light bringer, appears only once in the King James Version and is also a Latin name for the planet Venus, sometimes referred to as morning star, as it sometimes rises in the morning a few hours before the sun. In Isaiah, it says, quote, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Because of this one sentence, Lucifer has become equated with Satan, the devil, and the prince of darkness, which is actually pretty ironic if you think about it. So what does the light-bearing serpent tell Eve in the garden that has been left out of most mainstream renditions of ancient scripture? The source of the clip that I'm about to play for you comes from the work of Heinrich Arnold Krum Heller, a German naval intelligence officer, Rosicrucian, and founder of a hermetic order that operates in Brazil. He was also the private doctor of the Mexican president, Francisco Madero, and went by the motto Hiracocha, the name of a white god of creation once worshipped by the Incas of Peru. That said, he attained the highest rank available as far as secret societies go, and was held in high esteem by Samuel Ein Wyor, and it is one of Wyor's students who will be speaking in this brief excerpt on the secrets of Baphomet and giving more context of the role of the thief in mythology and what is meant by stealing the fire of the gods and how it relates to eating the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge. That was a great initiate that uh, Master Samael on the Or knew in South America, whose name was the Dr. Arnold Krumheller, a great uh, physician, doctor, from the University of Berlin. His inner name was Guiracocha. Matthew Samael Onveor mentioned Guiracocha in the, his book, The Perfect Matrimony. And he said, this is the mystery of Baphomet. Instead of the coitus, which reaches the sweet caresses, amorous phrases, and delicate touching should be lavished reflectively, keeping the mind constantly separated from animal sustaining the purest spirituality as if the act were a true religious ceremony. Nevertheless, the man can and should introduce the and keep it inside the feminine to bring about a divine sensation upon both, full of joy, that can last for hours, withdrawing it at the moment the is near to avoid the ejaculation of the transmission of magnetic fluids is ordinarily done through the hands and through the eyes. But it is necessary to say that there is no greater and more powerful conductor, a thousand times more powerful, a thousand times superior to others than the virile member and the vulva as receptive organs. This is what Master Wiracocha said. He, in other words, were disclosing the power of Baphomet. But many people didn't understand, even though he was also clear. This is the mystery of Baphomet. This is what the Master Samael Onveo wrote in the book Igneous Rose. He says, the rose elaborates its perfume with the clay of the earth, which is the physicality. The slithering worm does not like the gardener who removes its clay. Our disciples will now comprehend on what basis 
do the tenebrous ones qualify the sexual alchemists as thieves? And the proof is this. When you read the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, the very bottom of that uh, chapter, it is written, And they were both naked. But we put in parentheses the word that they use for naked. If you copy that word and put it in the dictionary, you will see that it has many meanings. And what of the meanings is thievish. And it's because it is precisely what an alchemist, a Templar, the one that knows the mystery of Baphomet, does. He steals the sexual force of nature. You have to know how to steal the energy from your own physicality, because that physicality, that flesh, is your own body. Master Samuel says, or the Genesis says, and they were both thievish, Adam and his wife, and were not ashamed. Because they were stealing from their own development, spiritual development. Now the devotees of the path will understand why Christ said, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Because this is how you develop the forces of heaven within you. The forces of heaven descends in your physicality. And you take it by force, by willpower. It's not easy. The weak succumb in the sexual act. And that's the mystery of Baphomet. You have to be a thief. And that's why the tenebrous, the fornicators from Klipoth accuse the alchemists are being thieves. Because we, when we transmute, we are really thieves. We like to steal for God. But it's not a stealing like in this physical world, money or dollars, because that's stupid. It's stealing from his own energy, his own force, his own physicality. And you transmute the sexual force. That's the mystery of Baphomet. That is taught by Moses through his Kabbalah in all the book of Genesis. When you are in the sexual act, you are touching the tree of life. But remember the commandment, don't eat of it. You touch the, the tree and you eat the fruit and that's precisely the problem. You can touch it, but don't eat it. Because by touching it is how you transform the energy and feed your spirit, your soul. But if you eat it, when you fornicate, you make lust and then the rest of egos inside. And you become idolatrous. Even if you don't have in your home statues and you think that only God you worship. But you are a fornicator, you are also a killer. Because you are killing the life. Or as in esotericism we say, any bodhisattva that falls into animal generation is accused of having killed the god Mercury or the Mercurius, which is the sexual energy. What are you performing when you are in fornication? The Zohar explains the different. You are a thief as well, but a bad thief after the orgasm. Of the animals. And the serpent said unto the woman. This is the next uh, graphic. Ye shall not surely die. For Elohim doth know. That in the day you eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be opened. And ye shall be as Elohim. Knowing good and evil. But when you eat it as God or with God together with God and you eat it and then your eyes are open but it's written that Adam and Eve or, or whether Eve tasted the fruit which was the orgasm that they taste and give it to the brain and both saw that they were naked completely without energy without force 
So we have two serpents here. The first is the tempting serpent, and the other is the, the serpent that gives life, which is the Kundalini. Humanity is following, of course, the tempting serpent. Because in the sexual embrace, when the flesh is receiving that magnetism in male and female, they enter into the temple, but to fornicate. And that's precisely to filth the tabernacle of God. Not to eat means to perform the sexual act and to transmute. To eat means to reach the orgasm, the spasm of the animals. Which in this planet Earth, everybody is eating, having a fist of the apple of tree. Right? But uh, you have to be careful. Because in the sexual act, you have to be, if you want to learn, you have to start little by little. Don't start like great uh, master of Tantra, you know, that practice hours. The master uh, with a coach says, they can endure, can endure for hours, right? But you say, oh, the master with a coach says, that can endure for hours, but you are not a master. He was a master with a coach. He said, you have to start. The master Samael says, you have to start for five minutes, 15 minutes, or as much as you can tolerate in order to teach your body because the serpent is wiser. You know, is a wiser animal of all the hayot that were created. So, uh, you said that um, well, it says in, the, in, in Genesis, you shall not touch it. But then you, then you said, we can touch the tree. So which, which one is it? We, we can touch it. We can't touch it. It's obviously. What Jehovah Elohim said is that you shall not eat of it. Right? And the woman says, not even touch it. Right? But then the serpent, according to Zohar, said, no, no, no. The thing is, you shall not eat. You can touch it. Look, I touch it and I don't die. Mm -hmm. And it's true. Because the Elohim touched and I don't die. But if you eat it, you will die. But uh, and then when Eve said, okay, I will touch it and I will try not to eat it. But she ate it and gave it to Adam. And they liked the orgasm. He says, oh, this is a good fruit. He says, uh, you forgot about that. This uh, for animals, not for us. And then they are kicked out of eating, etc., etc. We draw before the orgasm. This is the way in order to be born again. Women are in past times chased by, by, by nature. But in this day and age, there's a lot of pornography there and filthy things that teach the woman how to, how to reach bad. In other words, how to, uh, the woman had to be more bestial as she already is. And how the man can be more bestial as he already is. But uh, remember, the choice is yours. Take the path of the good or the evil. It's up to you. When you are in a sexual act, God is one. And if you pollute the sexual act, you are insulting that only God within you. Thank you very much. Ecstasy, or samadhi, is not a nebulous state, but a transcendental state of wonderment, which is associated with perfect mental clarity. On one given night, while in profound internal meditation, I abandoned this illusory world of maya. Thus, liberated from the shackles of this bitter existence, I submerged myself into samadhi within the world of the spirit. There is no better pleasure than feeling oneself as a soul detached from the body, the affections, and the mind. Samuel Ann Weyor My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an independent anthropologist and author my published books are available on Amazon.com. Kindly check them out if you're interested in the material I cover in these videos. I appreciate all of the Patreon subscribers 
And to those who have made a donation to Atlantean Gardens, thank you very much. And to those who contribute their time and effort by sharing these videos, I thank you very much as well. So please leave me a comment, let me know your thoughts, be safe, and I will see you again soon. While Europe has a very rich cultural history, ranging from fine art and architecture to dance, poetry, and music, most people are unaware of the subtle external influences on European traditions, especially starting around the time of the Renaissance, but even earlier, from places like the ancient Middle East. I use the word ancient to differentiate between modern Middle East which in many regards is a totally different place, both socially and in terms of demographics. In pre-Islamic Iraq and Iran, for example, which were once part of the Sumerian and Babylonian empires, we find that almost all of the ancient statues have blue eyes. A similar trait also evident in the ancient Egyptian statues of pharaohs and North African nobility, but is almost entirely missing in modern populations which no longer share much of the cultural or genetic affinities with the people who established and governed those ancient civilizations in the past. This is also the case in ancient India, as the ancient Aryan civilization that introduced the horse, Sanskrit, and the caste system to the subcontinent that carved those amazing stone temples is a far cry from the modern civilization in India of which hundreds of millions of people, close to half the modern population, do not even have a toilet, a statistic you can look up for yourself, such as from this BBC article that says, quote, only 46.9% of the 246 million households have lavatories, while 49.8% defecate in the open, end quote. So the point I'm making is the word Aryan which some correctly or incorrectly define as nobility, was an ancient culture, not a modern culture. And what was millennia ago in a particular region is not the same as what one sees today, and in most cases is similar only in name, myth, and legend. The same can be said for the similar carved stone temples of Lalibela in Ethiopia, which legend says were built by blonde angels which some have interpreted as being the Knights Templars around the 13th century. But even before the time of the Christian Crusaders, Ethiopia had a very different population, which is not only written about in ancient stories, which I've covered in other videos, such as the Queen of Sheba, I'll, I'll leave a link in the description if you haven't seen it, but is validated through DNA analysis, which points to ancient migrations into Africa from fair-skinned farmers from the Middle East and Anatolia thousands of years ago, introducing agriculture and domesticated animals to the continent. The phenomenon of changing demographics is also seen in places like Asia, which is why every single depiction of Buddha in Thailand is always shown with blue eyes, a feature not seen in the modern population or why China is littered with 4,000-year-old blonde mummies, many that are 6 foot 6 inches tall with Caucasian features, found near Chinese pyramids, which resemble the pyramids of Egypt and are oriented in the same way as well. Even historic figures are depicted very differently, such as Genghis Khan or the Islamic prophet Muhammad, both of whom had red hair, despite some of the newer modern racial depictions of them, which were altered from historic reality to appease the changing demographics of the regions 
and cultures from which they arose from. So the point I'm making is modern ethnicities from Japan to Peru, from Mesoamerica to Anatolia, worldwide, are very different, especially in terms of the ruling nobility today than they were, for example, during the Bronze Age, which coincides with the Age of Aries, or the Aryan Age, when we had a period of mass expansion, which history documents as the Aryan invasions. That said, we can start today's episode. It's amusing to read remarks made by the second century Christian writer, Justin Martyr, who accused the initiates of Mithras of imitating the Christian communion rite. While there are many similarities between Jesus and Mithras, a cult that existed in the Roman Empire prior to its adoption of Christianity by Emperor Constantine, such as Mithras' birthday being held on December 25th, when a solar feast was celebrated, or a text referring to salvation on the wall of St. Prisca Mithrium in Rome that contained the words when translated, quote, and you have saved us in the shed blood, or from Tertullian, a Christian Berber author who states that followers of Mithras were marked on their forehead with a mark, which some have interpreted as being in the shape of a cross. In any event, the pre-Christian Mithraic mysteries of ancient Rome centered around the ancient Iranian worship of the Zoroastrian god Mithra and was popular among the Roman military from the 1st to the 4th century, after which Mithraists faced persecution from Christians and the religion was subsequently suppressed and eliminated in the empire by the end of the century. Worshippers of Mithras had a complex system of seven grades of initiation and communal ritual meals where they met in underground temples, most of which were destroyed by Christians. Initiates were united by a special handshake, the remnants of which can still be seen in modern secret societies, which I will cover in detail in the future video. In this presentation, I would like to shift the focus to some other Middle Eastern influences which were adopted by Europe, stemming from ancient Babylonian astrologers and astronomers. Much of what is now part of European secret societies was imported by the Knights Templar, such as the Black Madonnas, which have nothing to do with ethnicity or skin color, but is a veiled symbol of what some define as goddess worship, venerated by Gnostics from ancient Egypt, Cathars, Rosicrucians, and whose occult philosophy can be traced back to Babylon and even earlier. These mystery school teachings and practices were demonized by the Christian church, rightfully or wrongfully, that's for you to decide, but they were outlawed, and so they went underground and were continued in secret. Understanding the origins and symbology of ancient belief systems will hopefully help bring about a better understanding of modern religious practices and traditions. Demons, genies, and discarnate spirits permeate ancient occult traditions in the Middle East and neighboring countries. An early 20th century Persian manuscript on magic and astrology, held at Princeton's Department of Rare Books and Special Collections, provide a glimpse into this mystical world with dozens of watercolor illustrations of demonic, otherworldly creatures. A demon is a supernatural being, which is usually described as being 
an evil spirit or entity. But I would also like to point out that the original Greek word, demon, didn't carry negative connotations and was thought as an inner spirit or inspiring force. For example, Socrates claimed to have lived his life according to the dictates of his demon. Dated to 1921, Kitabe Ajabi Mahlugat, which means Wonder of Creation, or The Book of Unusual Creations, includes an illustrated manuscript on magic and astrology, a book of spells listing incantations and talismans, and 56 painted illustrations of demons and angels. Several texts accompanying the illustrations in Farsi, an Indo-European or Aryan language from Iran, are dated from 1911 to 1921. A closing line at the end of the book suggests that it was composed of two main texts. It reads, The Book of the Wonders of Creation and 72 Demons Have Been Completed. Keep in mind that pre-Islamic Arabia included polytheistic beliefs, and Mecca itself was the place of worship for a goddess, similar to Ishtar, and Allah was one of 360 demon spirits worshipped in what is now the Kaaba in Mecca. The ancient religion was based on astronomical concepts and centered around divination, which was performed by tossing arrows or darts at a statue of a deity in the center, and the direction which the arrows pointed were interpreted as answered questions asked of the idol. Women touched the idol as a token of blessing and kept away from it during menstruation. Today, idol worship, divination, and even women are forbidden from holy sites in Mecca and during the annual Islamic Hajj pilgrimage where they throw stones or seven pebbles at walls or what used to be pillars instead, which is called stoning the devil. The text describes the different demons associated with each zodiac sign and the ailments associated with each and some of the remedies. The zodiac demons are introduced as a series of menacing, although somewhat endearing, beasts, some multi-headed. Each is depicted with cuffs on its clawed or hooved limbs, suggesting that these creatures had been bound or confined. Other illustrations show the monstrous demons in action, attempting to inflict harm on humans with inscriptions of spells and incantations in Farsi, which describe ailments and the demons associated with them, together with instructions on how to exercise them. So for instance, one inscription instructs sorcerers to take a handful of soil from underneath the feet of the possessed person and repeat the following sentence seven times. God of the heavens and the earth, hurry, hurry, bring back, bring back, bring back the love for virtue. By contrast, the manuscript also includes illustrations of winged angels like Michael and Gabriel who are summoned to expel demons and malign spirits. The author of the demonology book attributes his knowledge to the court of biblical King Solomon who was believed to possess power over demons and spirits. However, the author's identity remains a mystery. The author signs the book as Ramalbashi, the son of Jafar. However, Ramalbashi is not a name, but rather a profession derived from the Farsi word Ramal, which means healer or sorcerer, a type of occult expert to whom people would frequently turn in the event that they had problems that couldn't be solved by normal means, such as sicknesses, that appeared incurable, sort of like a witch doctor. They were usually sought primarily for divination, types of magic, breaking spells, exorcisms, and spirit summoning. Persian demonology has a long tradition that predates Islam. The Shahnameh, which means Book of Kings, a 50,000 verse epic poem written by the Persian poet Ferdowsi, is teeming with inscriptions of battles between humans, devils, and demons. Practicing Ramals still exist in Iran, typically performing palm reading, faith healing, and exorcism, but they've been outcasts to the fringes of society, usually ridiculed 
as the official clerical establishment denounces them and anything to do with the world of the unseen or with what Islam calls jinn, which in the West translates to genies. That said, these occult practices continue to thrive, not just in Iran, but also in neighboring countries, including many secret organizations, which boast membership from some of the most prominent elite governing modern Europe. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift and is the best way to support my work. I would like to thank those who support me through Atlantean Gardens on Patreon. I greatly appreciate it. There should be a link below for those that are interested. I would also like to thank anyone that has made a contribution during the live stream with a super chat or anyone that shares these videos after viewing them. As I rely on word of mouth, please remember to hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe for updates. And as always, I very much look forward to reading your thoughts in the comment section. So please leave a comment. Please have a wonderful week. And I hope to see you again soon. The Achaemenid, or the first Persian Empire, was founded by Cyrus the Great in 550 BC and extended from Eastern Europe in the West to the Indus Valley. It was larger than any previous known empire in history and was a success story in the sense that it incorporated many different cultures, ethnicities, races, and faiths, governing them very effectively, building road systems, postal systems, showing its citizens a lot of religious tolerance, and ruling from the standpoint of a liberator, rather than only with overt oppression. To quote Cyrus himself, whenever you act, act as a liberator. Freedom, dignity, wealth. These three together constitute the greatest happiness of humanity. If you bequeath all three to your people, their love for you will never die. Shah on Shah, or King of Kings, was the ruling title employed by the monarch in the empire. And the language in greatest use in the empire was Aramaic, but Old Persian was the official language of the empire, printed on gold and silver coins, but primarily used for inscriptions and royal proclamations. Now when I say Old Persian, that's because after World War II, federally funded schools and universities were not permitted to use the term used by the Achaemenids themselves, which is, of course, Aryan. To help illustrate this point, let us examine the Behistun inscription, a multilingual inscription made on a large rock relief in Iran, authored by Darius the Great, the son of Cyrus the Great. Located on Mount Behistun, which means place where the gods dwell, four similar tombs are cut into the stone cliffs. The site is known as Nakhche Rostam, meaning Pitcher of Rostam, from the images carved below the tomb, which were thought to represent the mythical hero Rostam. This inscription was crucial to the decipherment of cuneiform script, as the inscription includes three versions of the exact same text, written in three different cuneiform script languages. Elamite, Babylonian, which is a form of Akkadian, and Old Persian, which is actually called Aryan. The inscription is to cuneiform what the Rosetta Stone is to Egyptian hieroglyphs, the document most crucial in the decipherment of a previously lost script. In it, King Darius says, quote, I am Darius, the great king, the king of kings, the king of many countries and many people, the king of this expansive land, the son of Wishtaspa, Achaemenid, Persian, the son of a Persian, Aryan from the Aryan race. King Darius III was the last of the Achaemenian line and was overthrown by Alexander the Great. I've included a link in the description to a video I made on Alexander and how he earned the name Great, including a letter that he personally wrote to Darius III. Herodotus, the father of history, writes in his book, History of Herodotus, quote, In ancient times, the Greeks called Iranians Kafi, but they were renowned as Arians among themselves and their neighbors. 
In another part of his book, Herodotus writes that the Medians were known as Arians during a certain period. Ancient Persia was not the only place we find Arians, as they were also known in northern India, parts of China, and Europe, especially the steppes of Russia, where post-World War II political correctness did not seem to replace scientific correctness. Here, spiral cities were built on these remote Russian plains by swastika painting Aryans. Russian archaeologists have unearthed numerous settlements which they believe were built by the original Aryan race about 4,000 years ago. According to the team, they have discovered 20 of the spiral-shaped settlements in southern Siberia, bordering Kazakhstan, and they claim the buildings date back to the beginning of Western civilization in Europe. Many scientists agree that what is now a mere meadow in the hills was once the site of some urbanized capital city, the heart of an ancient civilization estimated to be as old as the Egyptian pyramids. Local scientist Dr. Gennadis Danoevich identified the outline of the ancient town behind the hills. 4,000 years ago, people moved to the area, building thick walls, mysterious towns, and solar observatories. Its tall walls and towers were destroyed a long time ago, and the town was ruined by fires, floods, winds, and time itself. Guys, look here. It's a pot. And it's a cross at the bottom. Archaeologists have since uncovered casting molds, blacksmith tools, and intricate works of bronze and ceramic. Archaeological digs have shown that the ancient town was inhabited by the forebears of the Aryan race. Those ancient Aryans were credited with everything on Earth. They were even said to have discovered metals. The Bronze Age settlements, the Russian archaeologists said, were built shortly after the Great Pyramid, some 4,000 years ago, by the original Aryan race whose swastika symbol was later adopted by the National Socialists in 1930s. And while the modern perspective is that the use of this symbol was an aberration, I would like to point out that before the Bolshevik takeover in Russia and the implementation of communism, this is what Russian money looked like. So, in light of the archaeological evidence, one must ask the question, was Russia being invaded by a military force that wanted to take over and rule the world, or was this battle an attempt to liberate Russia from a communist takeover that took place, decimating a civilization that once adorned its own currency with the exact same symbol? A communist takeover which was responsible for the deaths of tens of millions of Russians decades before World War II even happened. Of course, history is written by the victors, and modern academia, media, and currency is controlled by those same victors. And the point of this video is archaeological rather than political. That said, anthropology itself has become highly politicized, and where communism, to a large degree, has eradicated the memory of the great Aryan empires of the past in places like Russia and Europe. In the Middle East, Islam has imposed a similar effect on the collective consciousness. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift. Thank you to those who support me on Patreon. There should be a link below. Kindly share this video if you found it informative. Please hit the like button. Please don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell for future updates. I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comments section. Have a wonderful week and I hope to see you again soon. Most people have heard of the Book of the Dead, an ancient Egyptian funerary text generally written on papyrus but also on tomb paintings used from as early as the Third Dynasty of Egypt, which was a little under 5,000 years ago to around 50 BC. Prior to the New Kingdom, the Book of the Dead was only available to royalty and the elite. The title was given by Western scholars and the actual original Egyptian name for the text is translated as Book of Coming Forth by Day or Book of Emerging Forth into the Light and was used as a guide containing a set of instructions and a collection of spells 
with the goal of enabling the soul of the deceased to navigate the afterlife. To the ancient Egyptians, death was not an ending, and the afterlife was considered to be a continuation of life, where the soul passed through various difficulties and judgments, and so this afterlife manual was considered extremely useful. It also provided the soul with foreknowledge of what would be expected, and there wasn't one version, but this would be customized for the individual. That said, there have been some interesting articles that came out this week concerning what some are calling the ancient Egyptian board game of death. The game, called Senate, was played at all levels of Egyptian society from when it first emerged 5,000 years ago until it fell out of favor about 2,500 years later. Egyptologists believe Senate was played by two competitors on a board that resembled a cross between chess and backgammon where each person has five pawns that were placed on a grid of 30 squares arranged in three rows of 10. Then, by a roll of the dice, players would move their pawns with the goal being to have all five of your pawns reach the finish point at the lower right-hand corner of the board. Egyptian texts describe the game as depicting the movement of the soul through the Egyptian realm of the dead. Players threw an ancient equivalent of gaming dice to establish how many squares to move one of their pawns on a given turn. The use of dice seems to also have added an element of divination to the activity. A senate board is located in the Rosicrucian Egyptian Museum and while some believe the board started out as entertainment, Egyptian tomb art depicts the tomb's dead inhabitant playing senate against living friends and relatives, with texts from the time suggesting the game had been seen as a conduit through which the dead could communicate with the living. The age and archaeological context of the Rosicrucian board are unclear, but some archaeologists believe its style is unique to Egypt's Middle Kingdom period, between 4,000 and 3,700 years ago, and was probably about 3,500 years old. If you'd like to see it in person, the Rosicrucian Museum is located in San Jose, California. Architecturally inspired by the Temple of Amon in Karnak, it houses the largest collection of Egyptian artifacts on exhibit in Western North America, including objects from pre-dynastic times through Egypt's early Islamic era. The Rosicrucian Museum began with one small artifact, a Sekhmet or Lion Goddess statue, which stood on the desk of H. Spencer Lewis, the founder of the Rosicrucian Order. It cost between five and nine dollars per person to visit, I think depending on age, but if you can't make it yourself, I've included a brief tour here so you can get a feel of what it's like on the inside.
My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift. I greatly appreciate those who support me on Patreon. There should be a link below if you're interested. Kindly share this video if you found it informative. Please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comment section. Please have a wonderful week and I hope to see you again soon. Enchanted forests are described in the oldest folklore from regions where forests are common and are often alluded to as a place of magic and danger, a location beyond where people normally travel, where strange things might occur and strange people might live. Monsters, witches, fairies, dragons, dwarves, elves, giants, gnomes, trolls, Unicorns and other mythical creatures are depicted in books of fantasy for centuries, but whose oral tradition go all the way back to prehistory. Some stories have trees that talk or with branches that will push people off their horses. Others feature sorcerers and witches living somewhere in the depths of the forest. Anthropologically speaking, they represent places unknown to the characters and provides situations of transformation and liminality, a word which comes from the Latin word limin, meaning threshold, and is used in the context of the ambiguity or disorientation that occurs in the middle stages of a rite of passage, when participants no longer hold their pre-ritual status, but have not yet begun the transition to the status they will hold when the rite is complete. So it's where one is standing at the threshold between their previous way of being and a new way or identity which completing the rite establishes. In Norse myth and legend, Mirkwood was a dark and dangerous forest that separated various lands. Heroes and even gods had to traverse it with difficulty. Back in the early 1800s, Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm were brothers who while working as librarians, put together a collection of 86 stories, mostly from Germanic folklore, first published in 1812, and in all of them, the hero always goes into the forest. Acting as a place of transformation, the forest can also be a place of magical refuge, such as with Snow White, who escaped from her stepmother into a forest with dwarves. It is in the forest that the dwarf of Rumpelstiltskin reveals his name, allowing the heroine a way to free herself. In a study published in the journal Royal Society Open Science, a folklorist and anthropologist say that the popular stories and fairy tales are much older than originally thought. Instead of dating from the 1500s, the researchers say that some of these classic stories date back thousands of years. For example, Beauty and the Beast and Rumpelstiltskin to be about 4,000 years old. This contradicts previous speculation that story collectors like the Brothers Grimm were relaying tales that were only a few hundred years old. In the article, the team tracked the presence of the tales in 50 Indo-European or Aryan language-speaking populations they were able to find the ancestries of 76 tales, tracking them backward using language trees. As they tracked, they found evidence that some of the tales were actually based in other stories. More than a quarter of the stories turned out to have ancient roots. Jack and the Beanstalk was rooted in a group of stories classified as the boy who stole ogre's treasure and could be traced back to when Eastern and Western Indo-European languages split more than 5,000 years ago. And a folktale called The Smith and the Devil, about a blacksmith selling his soul in a pact with the devil in order to gain supernatural abilities, was estimated to go back 6,000 years. In it, a blacksmith strikes a deal with a malevolent supernatural being, 
such as the devil, death, or a genie, the blacksmith exchanges his soul for the power to weld any materials together. He then uses this power to stick the villain to an immovable object, such as a tree, to renege on his side of the bargain. This basic plot is stable throughout the Indo-European speaking world, from India to Scandinavia, according to this research. The findings seem to confirm the long disregarded theory of fairy tale writer Wilhelm Grimm, who thought that all Indo-European or Aryan cultures shared common tales. Some of the fairy tales go back thousands of years older than the earliest literary records, going back into the Bronze Age. The study said that this tale could be traced back to the Proto-Indo-European or Aryan society, when metallurgy likely existed and there was an archaeological and genetic evidence of massive territorial expansions by nomadic tribes from the southern Russian steppe and the northern shores of the Black Sea between five and 6,000 years ago. These findings are interesting, as a little over 7,000 years ago, the Black Sea, which was formed by melted glaciers, was a freshwater lake, until an event that geologists and anthropologists call the Black Sea Deluge happened, which not only flooded the people living near the shores, but the water was no longer usable for agricultural purposes, which may be a major impetus for the first waves of what is historically known as the Aryan invasions, where the Proto-Indo-Europeans, or Aryans, migrated to places where we find rivers for agricultural purposes, such as the Indus Valley, which did not have horses before the Aryans arrived, implementing an ethnic caste system, the remnants and traces of which can still be found in India today, not to mention Sanskrit, which is an Indo-European language. They also settled Iraq between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, establishing what eventually became some of the earliest empires of the Holocene, meaning our current age, the time following the Ice Age. Of course, these Aryans also penetrated into Europe, introducing domesticated animals to the continent, such as cows, and even today, Northern Europeans are among the most lactose-tolerant people on Earth, a genetic trait that comes directly from milk-drinking Aryans and is a clear genetic marker of the Aryan roots and genetic affinities in Scandinavia and the Germanic people. Another shared genetic indicator is blood type, such as a high degree of Rh negative, which I cover in my book, Species with Amnesia, and identify as a trait part of the haplotype that can be traced back into the Pleistocene, or Ice Age, to Cro-Magnon, the name of the first specimen found in a cave near the Atlantic, in the Pyrenees. Cro-Magnon is the direct ancestor of the population that settled near the Black Sea and Anatolia after the Ice Age, which incidentally is where Noah settled in the Bible, Mount Ararat, which is part of the Caucasus Mountains in modern Turkey and Armenia, and where the term Caucasian comes from, and from where the Aryans spread their languages, domesticated animals, and agricultural civilization from, and why they were considered the ethnic, blue-eyed nobility of every agricultural society of the Holocene, no exceptions. This may help to explain this quote by Rudolf Steiner, when he said, quote, The greatest part of the Atlantean population declined, and from a small portion are descended the so-called Aryans, who comprise present-day civilized humanity. Which brings me to another interesting quote by U.S. Congressman Ignatius Donnelly, who wrote in his book, Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, quote, did the Aryan race come from Atlantis? The center of the Aryan migrations was Armenia. Here too is Mount Ararat, where it is said the Ark rested, identified with the flood regions, representing the usual transfer of Atlantis legend by the Atlantean people to a high mountain in their new home. The Greeks, who are Aryans, 
trace their descent from the people who were destroyed by the flood, as did other races clearly Aryan. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift. Thank you to those who support me on Patreon. It has really helped me to increase my content output. So I am grateful and very much appreciate the support I've been receiving. There should be a link below for those who are interested. I also appreciate anyone that shares these videos. So thank you. Please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell for updates. I very much look forward to reading your thoughts in the comment section as always. Please have a wonderful week and I hope to see you again soon. The Phrygians were an ancient Indo-European or Aryan people who during classical antiquity lived in Western Anatolia or the Balkans and more specifically today's Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Eastern Germany, Albania and Western Ukraine. Herodotus states that according to the Macedonians they migrated into Anatolia probably between 1200 BC and 800 BC due to the Bronze Age collapse particularly the fall of the Hittite Empire. The state of Phrygia rose in the 8th century BC in modern Turkey, passed successively into the Persian Empire of Cyrus the Great, then the Empire of Alexander and his successors, and eventually became part of the Roman Empire. Herodotus also states that it was acknowledged by the Egyptians that the Phrygians were a nation older than the Egyptians. Josephus claimed that the Phrygians were founded by the biblical figure Togarma, grandson of Japheth, from who the ancient Aryans are said to be descended from. The Phrygian language is now extinct, but their cultural influence and identity can be recognized in ancient art. In classical Greek iconography, Paris, the son of King Priam of Troy, is represented as non-Greek by his Phrygian cap. And according to the Iliad, the Phrygians were Trojan allies during the Trojan War. It was worn also by Mithras, the Indo-Iranian or Aryan deity, which gave rise to a mystery cult in the Roman world whose cap has a soft conical shape. The Amazons, the tribe of women warriors of mythology are also associated with the Phrygian cap, which incidentally is where the Amazig, the Caucasian tribes of northern Africa around Mount Atlas, get their name. They're more commonly referred to as Berbers, but that's a derogatory term which comes from barbarians, who also were associated with the cap. The Scythians, another Aryan tribe, were also depicted wearing the Phrygian headgear as well as the Thracians, most notably Bendis, the Thracian goddess of the moon and the hunt. It survived into modern imagery as the liberty cap of the American and French revolutionaries, which came to signify freedom and the pursuit of liberty. But the Phrygian caps did not originally function as liberty caps. The original cap of liberty was the Roman Pallius, the felt cap of emancipated slaves of ancient Rome. I'll go into this in more detail in an upcoming video on Spartacus, a Thracian gladiator that escaped slavery and led an uprising against the Roman Republic. In the 4th century BC, the early Hellenistic period, the Phrygian cap was associated with Attis of Greek mythology, whose priests were eunuchs. This cult started with the deity Agdistus, who had both male and female attributes. As the story goes, the Olympian gods cut off the male organ and cast it away, but I'll leave this myth to a future video as well. Conical hats have also been attributed to witchcraft 
and forms of divination, with some very ancient ones made of gold thought to contain astronomical and calendrical symbols used in ancient rituals and prophecy. Early Christian art depicts the three wise men, the Magi, where we get the term magician as wearing the Phrygian cap, who were experts in the art of astrology and magic. The cap also appears in depictions of the legendary King Midas, who had the magic Midas touch, turning anything he touched into gold. This brings us to an interesting discovery made recently of a large inscribed stone found by a Turkish farmer while dredging an irrigation canal that has led to the uncovering of an ancient city belonging to a king rumored to have defeated King Midas, the mythical Greek ruler. The stone was extracted using the farmer's tractor and transported to a Turkish museum for cleaning, photographing, and translation. Scholars from the Oriental Institute translated the hieroglyphic markings written in Luwian, one of the oldest branches of Indo-European languages native to the Turkish region and read by alternating between right to left and left to right. Markings indicated that the messages came from a king named Hartapu towards the end of the 8th century BC, the same time as Midas's mythical rule and boasted of defeating the golden-handed king of Phrygia. So, it's possible that Midas is based on a real 8th century king. King Hartapu likely ruled the area surrounding the ancient city that would have covered an expanse of around 300 acres at its peak, making it one of the largest cities of the Bronze and Iron Age in Turkey. Today, a large earthen mound covers what archaeologists believe was a large empire 3,000 years ago. The lead archaeologist said, quote, Inside this mound are going to be palaces, monuments, and houses. This is a marvelous, incredibly lucky find. Excavations are planned for this summer. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift. Thank you so much to those who share these videos and who support me on Patreon. There should be a link below. Please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell for updates. I very much look forward to reading your thoughts in the comment section. Please have a wonderful week and I hope to see you again soon. Rome is the capital city of Italy located in the central western portion of the Italian peninsula. Its history spans 28 centuries, with Roman mythology dating the founding of Rome at about 753 BC. The city successively became the capital of the Roman Kingdom, the Roman Republic, and the Roman Empire. After the fall of the empire in the west, which marked the beginning of the Middle Ages, Rome slowly fell under the political control of the papacy, and in the 8th century it became the capital of the Papal States, which lasted until 1870. For those interested in the origins of the Vatican and how it got its name, I'll include a link in the description to a recent video presentation I made on the subject. Rome became the first one of the major centers of the Italian Renaissance and then the birthplace of both the Baroque style and Neoclassicism. Famous artists, painters, sculptors, and architects made Rome the center of their activity, creating masterpieces throughout the city. It was first called the Eternal City by the Roman poet Tibullus in the first century BC, and was also called Caput Mundi, meaning capital of the world. According to the founding myth of the city by the ancient Romans themselves, the long-held tradition of the origin of the name Roma is believed to have come from the city's founder and first king, Romulus. In Roman mythology, Romulus and Remus are twin brothers whose story tells the events that led to the founding of the city. The killing of Remus by his brother and other tales from their story are depicted in many works of art throughout the ages, including the image of the twins being suckled by a she-wolf, which has long been a symbol of the city of Rome 
and the Roman people. I'll get into that more a little later. First, I'd like to discuss a recent discovery that was made beneath the famous Roman Forum, also known by its Latin name, Forum Romanum. It's a rectangular plaza surrounded by the ruins of several important ancient government buildings at the center of the city. Citizens of the ancient city refer to this place, originally a marketplace, as the Forum Magnum, and for centuries it was a center of day-to-day -day life in Rome. Elections, public speeches, criminal trials, and gladiatorial matches all took place here, and it is decorated with statues and monuments commemorating the city's great men. The Roman kingdom's earliest shrines and temples were located around it, and now a tomb that was buried thousands of years ago and revered by ancient Romans as the resting place of their city's mythical founder, Romulus, has now been rediscovered beneath the Forum in Rome. The underground tomb and the temple built around it are thought to date from the 6th century BC, including an underground temple called Hypogeum in Greek that contains an altar and was dedicated to Romulus. The entrance to the tomb is hidden in the northwest of the Forum, underneath the building of the Senate House, the central meeting place of the ancient city where votes by public assemblies were conducted. The tomb is also near the Lapis Niger, meaning black stone in Latin, an ancient shrine paved in black marble with a stone marking the spot where Romulus was said to have been murdered by jealous members of the Senate a highly symbolic place for the political life of Rome. According to mythology, Romulus, the legendary founder of Rome, was said to have lived in the 8th century BC, but most mainstream historians don't think that he really existed in reality. In legend, Romulus and his twin brother Remus were the grandsons of Numitor, the deposed king of the Latin city of Alba Longa the sons of his daughter, Rhea Silvia, and the god Mars in human form. When the new king of Alba, Longa, ordered the infants Romulus and Remus thrown into the Tiber, the story goes, they were instead abandoned on the river bank. There, they were rescued by a she-wolf, who raised them until they were found by a shepherd. This story of babies found in a river has parallels with other myths and legends, such as with Hercules, or the biblical story of Moses, who was also discovered and raised after being placed in a basket and sent down a river. As well as Sargon the Great, the first ruler of the Akkadian Empire, known for his conquests of the Sumerian city-states in the 24th to 23rd centuries BC, sometimes identified as the first person in recorded history to rule over an empire. In cuneiform, it is written, and I quote, Sargon, the mighty king, king of Akkad, am I. My mother was a sacred prostitute. My father I did not know. The brother of my father dwelt in the mountain. My city is situated on the bank of the Euphrates. My priestess mother conceived me in secret, she brought me forth. She placed me in a basket of reeds, covered me, and cast me upon the rivers, which did not overflow me. The river carried me. It brought me to Aki, the irrigator. Aki, the irrigator, in the goodness of his heart, lifted me out. Aki, the irrigator, as his own son brought me up. Aki, the irrigator, as his gardener appointed me. When I was a gardener, the goddess Ishtar loved me, and for four years I ruled the kingdom. The black-headed peoples I ruled, I governed. Mighty mountains with axes of bronze I destroyed. I ascended the upper mountains, I burst through the lower mountains, the country of the sea I besieged three times. Whatsoever king shall be exalted after me, let him rule, let him govern the black-headed peoples. This brings us back to the she-wolf figure that I mentioned earlier. Dating back to the 5th century BC, it was from the Etruscans, the civilization that predated the Roman Empire, and is called 
La Lupa Capitolina, or the Capitoline Wolf. The term lupa, referring to she-wolf, is also a slang word for prostitute. Prostitution in ancient Rome was legal and licensed, and a brothel is commonly called lupinar, or lupinarium. That said, in ancient times, such was the case with Sargon the Great, a sacred prostitute was very different than what we understand it today, and was actually part of divine rituals usually reserved for royalty, nobility, and involved sacred acts and altered states of consciousness, which I've touched on before in prior presentations, but we'll revisit in more detail in a future video. This theme can be seen in numerous other legends, such as in Greek mythology, where Apollo's mother, Lido, was reported to have given birth to him as a she-wolf. This image of the she-wolf suckling the twins has been a symbol of Rome since ancient times and is one of the most recognizable icons of ancient mythology. To the Roman god Mars, the wolf is a sacred animal and they even have a festival called Lupercalia, a wolf festival observed in the city of Rome from the 13th to 15th of February, which mainstream anthropologists usually attribute to fertility but in actuality predates the Romans and involves sacred carnal rituals which are performed for divination, also linked to the Greek god Pan. I would also argue that these same carnal acts, and I can't get more descriptive than that due to censorship, but they were carried out by the ancient Greek priestesses of the Temple of Apollo at the sanctuary of Delphi, famous for divination, where an oracle was considered the gateway to knowing the will of the gods. This also ties into the goddess Vatica, which I already mentioned in a prior video with the link in the description. That said, the theories about volcanic gases and vapors seeping into the temple of Delphi, triggering these altered states in the priestesses, are either deceptive or put forth by people who are guessing and are not really in a position to know any better. In any event, Romulus and Remus restored their grandfather to the throne of Alba Longa and decided to build a new city overlooking the spot where they had been abandoned as infants. But according to the legend, they could not agree on which hill to build it, and Remus was killed by Romulus or his supporters in an argument. Romulus established Rome on the Palatine Hill and became its first king. In later centuries, it became a republic led by the Senate and an empire. The tomb of Romulus in the Forum became a mystical site for Romans, but the stone sarcophagus that archaeologists just found inside the tomb was empty. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon.com. They make a great gift. Thank you to those who support me on Patreon. There should be a link below for those that are interested. Please share this video if you found it informative. And don't forget to hit the like button. Please subscribe and click on the notification bell for future updates. I very much look forward to reading your thoughts in the comments section. Please have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you again soon. The common idea that the Romans took their religion from the Greeks is only half true. In actuality, it was from the Etruscans. But who were the Etruscans and where did they come from? Gone, but not completely erased, the ancient Etruscans left behind a legacy of extraordinary art, architecture, and technical innovation, so much so that to this day their influence still resonates. While their language is still largely a mystery, the Etruscans left behind about a half million tombs underground by which we are able to understand them. They believed death was only temporary that had opened a gateway to another world where people experienced an afterlife more vital and dynamic than that of the living. According to the English writer and poet D. H. Lawrence, quote, death to the Etruscans was a pleasant continuance of life 
with jewels and wine and flutes playing for the dance. It was neither an ecstasy of bliss, a heaven, nor a purgatory of torment. It was just the natural continuance of the fullness of life. Everything was in terms of life and living. In death, the rite of cremation was the usual method of burial during the earliest Etruscan period. The ritual was believed to represent the soul's liberation from the body as it was purified by fire. It is possible that the Etruscans were the first to cultivate grapes and introduce wine to Italy. Delicious and intoxicating, it was an important component at banquets, but wine was also vital for Etruscan religious ceremonies, an integral part of their lives. In the 4th century BC, the Greek historian Theopompus said of the Etruscans, quote, There is no shame to be seen committing a sexual act in public when they are at their gathering of friends. This is what they do first of all, when they have finished drinking and are ready for bed, and while the torches are still lighted, the servants bring in sometimes courtesans, sometimes their own wives. They all engage in making love while watching one another from isolating themselves with rat and screens set up around the couches, each couple wrapped in one cover. Keep in mind, this was from a Greek perspective. And while it is true that intimacy between the sexes was an accepted fact of daily life, as the images depicted in many Etruscans' tombs show numerous displays of love, affection, and warm moments. This contrasts sharply to illustrations of Greek men engaged in lust-filled acts only with female courtesans or young boys, but not with their wives. So where did the Etruscans originate from? Etruscan culture was very advanced and very different from other Italian cultures of the time. Though Roman historians played down their debt to the Etruscans, Etruscan culture permeated Roman art, architecture, and religion. They were master metallurgists and skillful seafarers who for a time dominated much of the Mediterranean. Because Italians take pride in the Roman Empire and the Etruscan state that preceded it, asserting a foreign origin for the Etruscans has long been politically controversial in Italy. That said, recent DNA analysis has revealed that Herodotus may have been correct when he said that the Etruscans immigrated from Lydia, a region on the eastern coast of ancient Turkey. He explains that after an 18-year famine in Lydia, the king dispatched half the population to look for a better life elsewhere. Herodotus claims that the Lydians built ships, loaded them up with all that they needed, and sailed from Anatolia until reaching Umbria in Italy. Geneticists at the University of Ferrara extracted mitochondrial DNA from individuals buried in Etruscan sites throughout Italy. In addition, three newer and independent sources of genetic data all point to the conclusion that Etruscan culture was imported to Italy from somewhere in the Near East. In Tuscany, part of the ancient Etruscan region of Etruria, the team found mitochondrial DNA lineages that occur nowhere else in Europe and are shared only with ancient Near Eastern people, as opposed to modern demographics that populate the region today ancient Anatolians. These findings, the team says, quote, support a direct genetic input from the Near East, a scenario in agreement with the Lydian origin of the Etruscans. Even DNA analysis of some Italian cattle has shown certain breeds to have originated in the Near East. So this explanation fits with Herodotus' remark that the Etruscans brought with them everything they needed. The Etruscans, a people that lived 2,500 years ago in central Italy, centuries before the Roman Empire. Their culture, their art and their treasures of unparalleled beauty still continue to captivate us. This is one of the highlights of the exhibition. It's a fibula, a brooch made of gold, with a ruby at the center. This would have been worn by a very wealthy, prominent Etruscan woman. They could afford to wear such beautiful jewelry. And they did it in abundance. 
Etruria, an area half the size of the Netherlands, is fertile and rich in precious metals. The Etruscans were traders, sailors, landowners. They were wealthy and in contact with the whole Mediterranean area. The Etruscan culture is strongly connected with the surrounding landscape. The Etruscans certainly have left their mark on the landscape. You can see their shrines, their necropolises. And the landscape that we associate with the Etruscans, it is very beautiful. This Tuscan and Umbrian countryside in which the Etruscans lived. The Etruscan cities were built on easily defendable hills of tough stone, still recognizable in today's landscape. Politically, Etruria was a collaboration between various city-states. Of their wooden houses, palaces and temples, only the foundations and the roofs are left. But their ancient cemeteries can be found everywhere. The Etruscans lived in the area between Rome and Florence. When you travel through that area today, you still see the remains of the Etruscans. You see roads which were built by the Etruscans to go from one place to another. You can still walk on the road today. You can still see what they have left 2,500 years later. The famous necropolis of Cerveteri. In the oldest burial mounds, we can recognize the roof of a tent. Later graves mimic a home with a beamed ceiling. Yet later, we see on the outside and the inside oriental-styled decorated graves with even carved beds. But what did the funeral of a wealthy Etruscan look like? We now think that the funeral was quite cheerful. When the deceased was placed in the tomb, it was accompanied by a meal, a feast. It was often the women who organized that. There was wine, drinking, roast meat, eating and drinking, maybe music and games. And then when the deceased was placed in the tomb, the entire inventory, the dishes, so to speak, were placed in the burial chamber. It is very rare that a tomb is found intact. But in 1836, near Cerveteri, the richest grave ever was found, the Regolini Galassi tomb. The contents of this family tomb are now in the treasures of the Vatican in Rome. It is an important resource for research into the lives of wealthy Etruscan men and women. The excavators were amazed by what they saw. They could not believe their eyes. Sources of the period tell us how the body in the main chamber of the tomb was literally covered in gold. That enormous fibula immediately aroused the curiosity of the scientists who tried to interpret its meaning, but also of goldsmiths. Until today, we cannot make these kinds of objects. The objects that were found in the grave are now digitally reconstructed. More than 2,500 years later, we can see what the tomb must have looked like. Near the town of Tarquinia, there is another famous necropolis. The burial mounds are gone, but underground we find burial chambers with vibrant and vulnerable murals. Here, the presence of Etruscans can easily be felt. We have dozens, if not hundreds, of tombs with paintings. Beautiful documentation for the life and death of the Etruscans. But it's only a tiny percentage which is painted, about 2%. It was the happy few who could afford tomb paintings. One of the most striking differences between the Etruscans and other peoples, like the Romans and the Greek, is the relationship between men and women. The role of women in the Etruscan society was more important than elsewhere. 
if we consider the Greek culture or even Rome, we can see radical differences. For instance, the fact that a woman could give her name to her son. From research, it has become more and more apparent that this is a specific element of Etruscan culture, which is in this sense very modern. Etruscan women took part in public life. They went into the stadium or watched the games. We have images that show them together with men, something which is very rare. With the Greek and the Romans, Besides the tomb paintings and funerary gifts, terracotta temple tiles are another important source of information about the Etruscan culture. Museum Villa Giulia in Rome has astonishing temple treasures, including the world-famous Apollo of Vi, who once stood on the roof of an Etruscan temple. A majestic temple about 15 meters high, with brightly colored figures on the roof, big, beautiful doors, and all covered in terracotta. It has been said that of all the peoples on earth, the Etruscans were the most religious. It has also been said that the Etruscans were the most superstitious. They thought that life was determined by the gods. Lightning was a sign of the gods, but also cow or sheep livers were a source of information for the Haruspex, the seer. Professor van der Meer uses an Etruscan liver model to study omens. This is the liver of a sheep. With the large lobe and the small lobe, this is the head of the liver. On this liver model, you can see the kaput, the head. If there was a head on the liver, it was a good sign for the Etruscans. If the head was missing, it was a negative sign, and the consultation was stopped. Was the head intact? You would look at other parts of the liver with a specific question, are we going to wage war or not? Some scholars think that the north was here, and the south was here. The east was favorable, the west was unfavorable, with further precision. The north, east, very favorable. Even after thousands of years, the Etruscans continue to delight and move us. Last week I unpacked a statue which is part of the exhibition and I was really touched by it. Even now, it is extraordinary that it still evokes this emotion after all these years. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist you can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift. Thank you to those who support me on Patreon. There should be a link below. Kindly share this video if you found it informative. Please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell for updates. I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comment section. Have a wonderful week and I hope to see you again soon. In mythology, the Greek underworld is an other world where souls go after death. The original Greek idea of afterlife is that at the moment of death, the soul is separated from the corpse, taking on the shape of the former person and is transported to the entrance of the underworld. The underworld itself, sometimes known as Hades, is considered the dark counterpart to the brightness of Mount Olympus with the kingdom of the dead corresponding to the kingdom of the gods, a realm invisible to the living made solely for the dead. According to Greek mythology, Persephone, daughter of Zeus, is the queen of the underworld. During the six months that Persephone spent in the underworld, her mother was sad and not in the mood to deal with the harvest. Thus, she would leave the earth to decline. These were the months of autumn and winter when the land is not fertile and does not give crops. Whenever Persephone went to Olympus to live during the spring and summer, the land would become fertile again and fruitful. 
Therefore, one aspect of the myth was created to explain the change of the seasons and the eternal cycle of nature's death and rebirth. Hell, spelled H-E-L, means hidden and was the Old Norse underworld goddess that ruled over the identically named Hell, the place where many of the dead were said to dwell. Alatu is an underworld goddess that was worshipped by the Carthaginians. Carthage was the center or capital city of the ancient Carthaginian civilization on the eastern side of Lake Tunis in what is now Tunisia, the North African nation located in the southern Mediterranean, one of the most affluent cities of the ancient world. The religion of Carthage was a direct continuation of the Phoenicians, and the ancient Canaanites that included child sacrifice. While the Phoenician pantheon was presided over by the father of the gods, Baal Haman, a goddess was the principal figure in the Phoenician pantheon called Tanit or Tangu, meaning the sun, but equivalent to the moon goddess Astarte, later worshipped in Roman Carthage. She was also known as Tango, meaning land of the lions, and was sometimes depicted with a lion's head. The ancient Berber people also adopted her cult, and to the ancient Egyptians, her name means Land of Neith, a goddess of wisdom. In Carthage, Tanit's symbol can be found in a tophet, a name given to the place where sacrifice was conducted, and is sometimes interpreted by some academics as a woman raising her hands. Some researchers have disputed the evidence pointing to child sacrifice, with one study interpreting the Carthage Tophet as a child cemetery of children that died naturally. That said, the evidence, in my estimation, becomes overwhelming when combined with ancient literary sources, such as the Bible, where accounts of child sacrifice can be compared with similar ones from Greek and Latin sources speaking of the offering of children by fire as sacrifices in the city of Carthage. For example, Plutarch mentions the practice, as does Tertullian, Clitarchus, historian of Alexander the Great, Orosius, Philo, and Diodorus of Sicily, who wrote, quote, In former times, the Carthaginians had been accustomed to sacrifice to this god, the noblest of their sons, but more recently, secretly buying and nurturing children that had sent these to the sacrifice. According to Justin, the Latin writer who lived under the Roman Empire, the Carthaginians accepted the Persian Empire's instructions to stop sacrificing children and eating dogs. Tertullian, in about the year 200, states that although the priests who sacrificed children had been crucified by Romans, quote, that holy crime persists in secret, end quote. Of course, sacrifice was also a custom in Mesoamerica, where the Aztecs would often perform the ritual with prisoners captured in war. The most common form of sacrifice was to open the chests of the victim and rip out their still-beating hearts. Aztecs weren't the only pre-Columbian Americans that sacrificed people. Mayans did that too, as did the Inca. While this practice is no longer done in modern Mexico, the goddess Kali still receives some sacrifices from time to time in modern India, especially in remote rural provinces, with beheadings being one of the preferred methods. Many are quick to point out that the Bible denounces the practice of sacrifice, with the Vatican regarded by millions as a symbol of Christianity. But what is the ancient history of this location in Italy, and what are the origins of its name? In actuality, the Vatican is neither Latin nor Greek, and it cannot be traced to the Bible either. While the word Vatican is associated with the Church, it predates Christianity and is closely linked to the Etruscan goddess Vatica. Located in Rome, the Vatican is a symbol of the Roman Catholic faith and as a city-state was founded on February 11, 1929, as the world's smallest independent country by both population and area, with a population of around 840, 
and an area of about 108 acres, but with an influence over millions of people that span the globe. Yet, as with many other Christian traditions and customs, the Vatican has a pagan origin, and about 3,000 years ago, the Etruscans settled the region of central Italy, known as Etruria, and ruled that part of the Mediterranean before the rise of Rome. While most of the Etruscan literature and mythology has been lost, we do know that they built a large cemetery on a hillside slope outside their ancient city in the area that later became the city of Rome. And the guardian of this necropolis was the Etruscan goddess Vatica, goddess of the underworld, whose duty was to keep a watching eye on those who had passed away. It seems that the Etruscan beliefs about the afterlife were similar to those of ancient Egyptians, where treatment of the deceased remains was important for survival and a successful journey to the next life. According to Etruscan mythology, Vanth was a death demon that attended from the moment of death until entry to the underworld, usually depicted with wings and had bearded snakes entwined around her arm. In addition to being goddess of the underworld, Vatica was also a bitter-tasting grape used to make wine that grew on the slope. When people ate it, they experienced hallucinations and a word passed on into Latin as a synonym for prophetic vision. The Latin word Vaticaner means foretell or prophecy from vadis, poet, teacher, oracle. So while according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, the origin of the name Vaticanus is uncertain, other sources claim that it comes from the ancient Etruscan language, and the Vatican Hill takes its name from the Latin word Vaticanus, alluding to the drug-induced oracles, or fortune-teller priestesses, which delivered their prophecy there in ancient times. The area, which is now St. Peter's, thus became known as Vatican Hill. Another proposed connection to the word Vatica relates to the tika, or dot, of jewelry Hindu women place on their forehead to indicate the third eye, and corresponds to the pineal gland, and also related to psychic phenomena, intuition, and the Hindu sixth chakra. In addition to melatonin, the pineal gland is thought to produce a molecule known as DMT, a powerful hallucinogen and appears to be related to dreaming and near-death experiences. It's interesting to note that some Hindu monasteries are also called Vatica, which is used to describe a religious center. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift. Thank you so much to those who support me on Patreon. I greatly appreciate it. There should be a link below. Kindly share this video if you found it informative. Please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell for updates. I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comments section. Please have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you again soon. In our modern information age, it seems that libraries have become almost obsolete. With so much data available over the internet, and in most cases right from the phone in our pocket, the idea of going someplace to search through individual books seems like a tedious, distant memory. But in antiquity, libraries were the great storehouses of knowledge, magnificent structures where humanity's collective wisdom and history was preserved, where records were stored for future generations to learn from and to add to. In the ancient world, there were several examples that come to mind such as the Villa of Papyri, which is located in the Roman city of Herculaneum, in a villa that was most likely built by Julius Caesar's father-in-law, and contained roughly 1,800 squirrels, which were all buried when nearby Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD. It was recently reopened to the public almost 2,000 years after it was submerged under a 90-foot layer of volcanic ash and mud and remarkably preserved. Its blackened carbonized scrolls have been rediscovered and researchers are using everything from multispectral imaging to x-rays to try to read them. 
the Library of Celsus in modern-day Turkey, was established around 120 AD, and the building's ornate facade still stands today and features a marble stairway and columns, as well as four statues representing wisdom, virtue, intelligence, and knowledge. The library may have held some 12,000 scrolls and was named after the Roman consul Tiberius Julius Celsus, who was buried in an ornamental sarcophagus inside the library. Long after the Western Roman Empire had gone into decline, classical Greek and Roman thought continued to flourish in Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire, and the city's imperial library first came into existence in the 4th century AD under Constantine the Great. At its peak, its collection grew to a staggering 120,000 scrolls, but suffered a devastating blow after a crusader army sacked Constantinople in 1204. Nevertheless, its scribes and scholars are now credited with preserving countless pieces of ancient Greek and Roman literature by making parchment copies of deteriorating papyrus scrolls. Another exquisite example is the Library of Pergamum, constructed in the 3rd century BC, also in what is now Turkey. It was once home to a treasure trove of some 200,000 scrolls, housed in a temple complex devoted to Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom. According to the ancient chronicler Pliny the Elder, the Library of Pergamum eventually became so famous that it was considered to be in keen competition with the Library of Alexandria. Both sites sought to amass the most complete collections of texts and they developed rival schools of thought and criticism. There's even a legend that Egypt's Ptolemaic dynasty halted shipments of papyrus to Pergamum in the hope of slowing its growth. Of course, the ancient library of Alexandria, Egypt, is probably the most famous ancient library, in part due to its tragic destruction, which was considered one of the great losses in history. The city of Alexandria gets its name from Alexander the Great, and following his death in 323 BC, control of Egypt fell to his former general, Ptolemy, who sought to fulfill Alexander's wish of establishing a center of learning, which eventually became the intellectual jewel of the ancient world. Little is known about the library's physical layout, but at its peak, it may have included over 500,000 papyrus scrolls containing works of literature, history, law, mathematics, science, and sacred occult knowledge allegedly passed down from the time of Atlantis. But the world's oldest known library was founded sometime in the 7th century BC for the Assyrian ruler Ashurbanipal, regarded as the last great ruler of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. Located in Nineveh, in modern-day Iraq, the site included a trove of some 30,000 cuneiform tablets organized according to subject matter. The king's personal library covered such areas of knowledge as medicine, mythology, magic, science, poetry, and geography but it also housed several works of literature, including the 4,000-year-old Epic of Gilgamesh. According to Old Persian and Armenian traditions, Alexander the Great himself saw the Royal Library of Ashurbanipal when he visited Nineveh and was inspired by it, so much so that he desired to seek out all the works of the people he had conquered, translate them into Greek, and store them in a great library of his own which was completed after his death. As for Ashurbanipal, he acquired many of his tablets through plunder from places like Babylonia, and interestingly seems to have been particularly worried about theft. An inscription in one of the texts warns that if anyone steals its tablets, the gods will cast them down and, quote, erase his name, his seed, in the land. That said, the majority of its contents are now kept in the British Museum in London. There's a project called the Ashurbanipal Library Project, which is a collaboration between the British Museum 
and the University of Mosul in Iraq, which aims to bring the library back to life by documenting the cuneiform tablets as fully as possible in texts and images, making them available online, accessible from your smartphone. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift. Thank you so much to those who support me on Patreon. I truly appreciate it. And there should be a link below for those that are interested. Kindly share this video. Please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell for updates. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comment section. Please have a wonderful week and I hope to see you again soon. The Viking Age, the period of great Scandinavian expansion from the 8th to the late 11th century, is normally associated with violent raids and warfare. But in fact, Viking people were highly civilized and greatly valued the arts, especially storytelling about ancient myths, heroic legends, folk tales, and family and local histories. These stories circulated orally, often in the form of epic poems, usually passed on through successive generations, but many were written down in the 13th century, mainly by scholars in Iceland, which today form the basis of much of what we know about the ancient Norse myths and legends, sagas, which were supposedly based on true stories of real Viking Age people. I thought I'd share a list of five of the most memorable Viking tales, in no particular order. Number 1. Odin Wins the Runes During the pagan era, Odin was respected as the mysterious and omniscient god of war, wisdom, death, and fate. Sacrifices were often made to him, particularly in times of conflict. It was said that he sometimes traveled through the human world in disguise, meddling in people's affairs, or changing the course of battles. Mystical stories link Odin to the Vikings' only form of writing during the pagan era by carving rune letters into wood, stone, metal, or bone. The myth appears in 25 cryptic verses of a poem called Havamal, meaning the sayings of the High One, possibly dating back to the 9th century. It's often claimed to be in Odin's own words and describes him sacrificing himself to himself by hanging upside down on a lonely tree for nine nights. Finally, he has a vision of the runes, alongside the secrets of many esoteric spells. I plan on a future video on this, with an in-depth interpretation and explanation of its occult significance. Number 2. The Norse Discovery of America I've already covered this topic in a video about Eric the Red, featuring data from medieval manuscript Eric's Saga, which claims that in early 11th century, 500 years before Columbus, Viking men and women reached North America and established settlements there, as well as in Greenland. They describe how an unknown country was initially sighted by a ship blown off course in bad weather, and shortly afterwards by a series of expeditions that set out from the Viking colony in Greenland in order to explore it. They came to a rich and fertile land full of game and timber. They also found wild grapes growing in profusion, so they called it Vinland, which means Wineland. One group attempted to settle there, including a woman who gave birth to the first European child born on American soil since the Salutrian times, but they made a hasty retreat after an altercation with some of the local Native American people. For many centuries, these accounts were regarded with great skepticism until eight 11th century Viking-style houses, a forge, and four workshops were excavated in Newfoundland, Canada, providing conclusive proof that the sagas were true. Number three, Ragnarok. Like other world religions, Viking paganism included an apocalyptic vision predicting that the existing world will be destroyed by cosmic forces and characters and will then be reborn into a new, more perfect age. 
This scenario is most vividly brought to life in the 10th or 11th century poem called Voluspa, which is the prophecy of the seeress, possibly developed from a series of dreams experienced by a real-life wise woman, or what some today may refer to as a witch. As horror overwhelms the world, causing it to freeze and wither, gods, monsters, and giants engage in cosmic battle until even Odin and the sun itself is vanquished. However, the poem ends with the optimistic promise of a new world rising from the ruins of the old. After the cataclysmic events, the world will resurface anew and fertile, the surviving and returning gods will meet and the world will be repopulated by two human survivors. A powerful and haunting tale which probably deserves its own video as well. Number 4. Valund and Smith This heroic legend, illustrated on Viking Age carvings from England and Sweden, is part fairy tale, part horror story. Valund is a princely goldsmith who fashions exquisite rings. In the romantic opening, he falls in love with a spirited Valkyrie, who comes to him in the form of a swan maiden. However, after a brief marriage, she abandons him and returns to work on the battlefield, gathering up slain warriors to be honored by Odin. As he grieves over his loss, Balund is abducted by an enemy king who imprisons him on an island for refusing to marry his daughter. The hero's revenge is to murder the girl's brothers and fashion their body parts into grisly jewelry, which he presents to his unwitting captors. In a final twist, he forges himself some gold wings and flies away to resume his search for his lost wife. The popularity of this tale clearly extended even beyond the Viking world, for Verlund is also mentioned in Anglo-Saxon poems, including Beowulf, which was featured in a recent video I made. I'll place a link to it in the description in case you missed it. And number 5. The Theft of Thor's Hammer Viking pagan mythology is dominated by eternal conflict between the gods and their arch enemies, the giants. Among the gods, the role of chief giant basher belonged to the mighty Thor. As defender of both the divine and human realms, he had a penchant for smashing in the skulls of giants with his magic hammer. And in this tale, it is stolen by one of the giants refuses to return it unless the beautiful goddess Freya agrees to marry him. Thor gallantly disguises himself as the requested bride, a truly courageous act in a society where cross-dressing was considered an outrage against virility. He travels to giant land and pretends to take part in the wedding. As soon as the hammer is delivered in accordance with the bargain, Thor seizes it and destroys the giant in a single blow. Thor's popularity in Viking times is demonstrated by the many pagan temples that were dedicated to him and the large number of miniature hammer pendants excavated. Those were five of my favorite Viking stories. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift. Thank you so much to those who support me on Patreon. There should be a link below in the description section for those that are interested. Please share this video if you found it informative. Please hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe. Make sure you click on the notification bell for updates. I very much look forward to reading your thoughts in the comment section. Please have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you again soon. With Valentine's Day just around the corner, I thought I'd do an episode regarding love, or more specifically, love's most universally accepted symbol the one we most commonly associate with a heart. This shape, however, with its round top and pointy end, doesn't really resemble the organ it is said to represent. So what is the origin of this symbol? There are plenty of theories about where the heart shape came from, ranging from a Catholic saint's divine hallucinations to a bad organ description by Aristotle. Another belief has the symbol originating from the shape of leaves, typically ivy leaves, as the Greeks associated ivy with the god Dionysus, the god of passion, wine, and other sensual rituals and activities. To get to the bottom of this mystery, we need to go to ancient North Africa, 
to a place called Sirene, an ancient Greek and later Roman city near present-day Shahat, Libya. It was the oldest and most important of the five Greek cities in the region, founded in 631 BC and abandoned in the 4th century. It was founded and named by Apollo, after a Thessalian princess in Greek mythology, a region of Greece which used to be known as Aeolia, as it appeared in Homer's Odyssey. As the myth goes, she was tending to her father's sheep one day when a lion attacked one of them. She wrestled it to the ground, and Apollo, seeing her do this, fell in love with her and took her to Africa, where she then ruled the fertile and rich land. In another account, a monstrous lion had terrorized the citizens greatly, so Apollo brought Sereni to get rid of the beast, which she did, and as with many myths involving troublesome dragons and serpents, some interpretations have the animal as a symbolic representation of a certain tribe or race, but I will elaborate on that in a future video. For now, I'll just say that she succeeded in subduing the lion and was given a kingdom to rule. The name Sereni means sovereign queen, and the crop that was most famously grown in her land was silphium, which once grew in Sereni in abundance and was described to be a type of giant fennel with crunchy stalks and small clumps of yellow flowers. From its stem and roots, it emitted a pungent sap that Pliny the Elder called amongst the most precious gifts presented to us by nature. Exports of the plant and its resin made Sereni the richest city on the continent at the time. It was so valuable, in fact, that Sirenians began printing it on their money. Silver coins from the 6th century BC are imprinted with images of the plant's stalk, a thick column with flowers on top and leaves sticking out, and its seed pods which look like this. According to Pliny, it was a kind of cure-all, used to treat everything from chills to fevers to corns. Best of all, he wrote, quote, it is never productive of flatulency. Hippocrates said it could be used as a poultice or to soothe the stomach. Cooks also used the plant in their recipes, perhaps the same way we use fennel seeds today. In classical antiquity, its uses included as a seasoning, perfume, as an aphrodisiac, or as a medicine, and more specifically, it was most famously used as a type of birth control. According to the historian John Riddle in his book, Eve's Herbs, A History of Contraception and Abortion in the West, quote, anecdotal and medical evidence from classical antiquity tells us that the drug of choice for contraception was silphium. John Riddle also describes another, more explicit, Serenian coin of, quote, a seated woman with silphium at her feet while one hand touches the plant and the other points to her reproductive area. Silphium was so critical to the Serenian economy that most of their coins bore a picture of the plant itself. The Minoans and ancient Egyptians developed a specific glyph to represent the silphium plant. It was used widely by most ancient Mediterranean cultures. The Romans, who mentioned the plant in poems or songs, considered it worth its weight in denarii, which were silver coins, or even gold. Legend said that it was a gift from the god Apollo. The ancient physician Serranus suggested taking a dose of silphium the size of a chickpea once a month both prevented conception and destroyed any already existing. In his poem, Catalyst wrote that he wanted to share as many kisses with his beloved as the number of Libyan sands that lie in the silphium bearing Sereni. The exact identity of silphium is unclear, and today ancient silphium is likely extinct, commonly believed to have been a flowering plant that was part of the carrot family. Some of the speculation about the cause of its extinction rests on a sudden demand for animals that grazed on the plant for some supposed effect on the quality of the meat. That said, it is more commonly said that demand for its contraceptive use and over-harvesting was likely to be the real reason 
leading to its extinction around the second century BC. Pliny the Elder reported that the last known stock of silphium found in Cyrenica was given to the Emperor Nero as a curiosity. Gradually, the heart came to be depicted in red, a color that is also a symbol of passion and love and was associated with the divine feminine power. The inverted triangle also symbolizes the water element, which makes the heart a sign of intuition, psychic perception, affection, and love. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift. Thank you to those who support me on Patreon. There should be a link below. Please share this video if you found it informative. Kindly hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell for updates. I very much look forward to reading your thoughts in the comment section. Please have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you again soon. For most ancient Greeks, the Trojan War was much more than just a myth. It was a defining moment in their distant past. According to Herodotus, the writer from the 5th century BC considered the father of history, it was generally assumed to have been a real event. And while it is true that Herodotus sometimes exaggerates for effect, his accounts have consistently been found to be more or less reliable. The name Troy refers both to a place in legend and a real-life archaeological site. In legend, Troy is a city that was besieged for 10 years and eventually conquered by a Greek army led by King Agamemnon. The reason for the wars was, according to Homer's Iliad, the abduction of Helen, a queen from Sparta, by Paris, the son of Troy's king Priam. In some non-literal but deeper, hidden, or occult interpretations of the myth, Helen of Troy is linked to Lilith as the personification of death, but not in the physical context. In the mystery schools, death has a different spiritual meaning as set forth in the Zohar, for example, concerning certain interpretations of the consequences brought about by the apple in the Garden of Eden story. Throughout the Iliad, the gods constantly intervene in support of characters on both sides of the conflict. Troy also refers to a real ancient city located on the northwest coast of Turkey, which, since antiquity, has been identified by many as being the Troy discussed in legend. Whether the Trojan War actually took place and whether the site in northwest Turkey is the same Troy is still a matter of debate. According to legend, the Trojan War took place near the end of the Bronze Age, probably before 1200 BC, possibly around the time that the Mycenaean civilization flourished in Greece. According to Heinrich Schliemann, who conducted a series of excavations in modern-day Turkey in the 1870s, the city of Troy goes back at least 2,700 years, backed by treasures he discovered and claimed to be from King Priam. While there's no doubt that Schliemann did find golden artifacts, ancient swastikas, and real remnants from an ancient city in Anatolia located where Troy was said to have once stood, it is still questionable if this was the same Troy spoken about in Greek mythology or another city built upon it centuries later. The earliest account for this war comes from Homer, who lived around the 8th century BC, several centuries after the event took place, and doesn't appear to have been written down until even later, likely during the 6th century BC. Homer's Iliad is an ancient Greek epic poem set in the 10th year of the siege against Troy. A number of key events happen in the poem, including a duel between the king of Sparta and husband of Helen against Paris, with the winner supposed to receive Helen as a prize, ending the war. However, the gods intervene to break up the duel before it's finished and the war continues. Contrary to popular belief, the Iliad does not end with the destruction of Troy, but with a temporary truce after which the fighting presumably continues. Another work attributed to Homer is the Odyssey, 
set after the destruction of the city, referencing how the Greeks took Troy using the famous Trojan horse, a wooden structure concealing warriors within it. The city, immortalized by Homer's poems and allegedly discovered by Heinrich Schliemann, seems to be located on an archaeological site that shows that it was inhabited going back at least 5,000 years, not to mention other nearby sites such as Gobekli Tepe that date back twice as far. After one city was destroyed, a new city would be built on top of it, creating a human-made mound called a tell. According to researchers from the University of Amsterdam, there is not one single Troy, there are at least 10 lying in layers on top of each other. So while Schliemann's 17-year-old Greek wife, Sophia, looked very impressive, adorned in all that ancient gold and treasures he discovered, there still remains doubt if he dug down deep enough to reach the actual Troy spoken about in myth, and not another city built upon it at a later date. The same could be said about the famous funeral mask of Agamemnon that he discovered in 1876, with no real indication it actually belonged to the Mycenaean king Agamemnon, leader of the Greeks in Homer's Iliad, despite the fact that it was made of gold and was found at the site of Mycenae. That said, let's take a closer look at the mythology from another perspective. If you study the Iliad closely, you'll discover that the shields of the leaders of the Greek armies at the siege of Troy were painted with lions or serpents, while the Trojan defenders also had lions or eagles on their shields. The Iliad also describes a huge eagle as appearing over the contending armies at the siege of Troy. What do these symbols mean? According to Josephus in his Antiquities of the Jews, the Spartan king Arios sent an embassy to the Jewish high priest acknowledging that the Jews and Spartans were racially akin, both having descended from Abraham. It's also interesting to note that the seal on the letter from Sparta showed an eagle holding a serpent, a symbol we see in other places, which I will get to in a future video. As for the Trojan lion, this is also a biblically referenced symbol we find in Genesis. So were some of the ancient Greeks and Trojans related to each other? In the Greek legends, we find that Dardanus, son of Zeus and Electra, was the founder of Dardanus in Troad, named after himself. Troad was a region in Anatolia, and according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, Dardanus became the founder of the royal house of Troy. His original home being Arcadia, which was located in the Peloponnese. Peloponnese is the region of Greece where the Spartans were from. So where did Dardanus come from? I'll get to that shortly. According to the 9th century British historian and Welsh monk Nennius, who authored the history of the Britons about the ancient history of the indigenous British folk, a group of people under the leadership of Brutus from whom Britain took its name, invaded England some 1,100 years before the time of Jesus, or over 3,000 years ago, and set up a dynasty of British kings. The legends and histories of the ancient world trace Brutus and his people back to Italy, and through his ancestors, back to ancient Troy. Keep in mind, this was a time of major upheaval and earth changes in the area which affected the entire Mediterranean. Many scholars attribute this time as coinciding with what is recorded in the Bible as the time of Exodus. Hecateus of Abdera, a 4th century BC Greek historian, states that, quote, Now the Egyptians say that also after these events, a great number of colonies were spread from Egypt all over the inhabited world. They say also that those who set forth with Danis, likewise from Egypt, settled what is practically the oldest city of Greece, Argos, end quote. Some scholars leak Dardanus with Darda of the Bible, the son of Zara and grandson of Judah. The Athenians 
believed that they themselves were colonists from Sias in Egypt, according to Diodorus of Sicily, the ancient Greek historian and author of Bibliotheca Historica from around 60 BC. That said, according to the Egyptians, via Plato, the ancient Egyptian priests of Sias said that both Sias in Egypt and Athens of Greece were founded by the same patron goddess Athena or Neith to the Egyptians. So it becomes interesting once we make the connection between Egypt, Greece, Italy, ancient Anatolia or Troy, and Northern Europe or Britain. In my last video, we talked about the Etruscans, the civilization that predated the Roman Empire in Italy, who did not call themselves Etruscan, which comes from Etruria or Tuscana, the Roman name of their homeland. Etruscans called themselves Rosena or Rosna or later Rutuli, all of which come to mean red or the red ones. We know the Etruscans depicted themselves painted red and even with blonde hair used red ochre to color their skin red, much like another ancient Mediterranean civilization from the island of Crete, the Minoans, which is also not what they called themselves, as Minoan comes from Minotaur, which translated means bull of Minos. That said, the Minoans, like the Etruscans, also painted their white skin with red ochre and like the Etruscans, worshipped the goddess and revered the serpent. The ancient Egyptian pharaohs also depicted themselves as red, applying red ochre to their skin and mummies as depicted in their art along with the serpent. Which brings us to the Phoenicians, a maritime civilization of the ancient Mediterranean who are considered Canaanites and were called Phoenicians by the Greek from the Greek word phinos, meaning red. Also, in a recent video, I talked about the Vikings, Eric the Red, and I said that his name was likely due to his red beard, which may or may not have been his natural hair color, but I used some ambiguity because I didn't want to get into what I'm discussing now, which is a link between the Viking runes and the Phoenician alphabet, both of whom share similarities not only in ship design, but both adorned their vessels with serpents, as did the Etruscans, who incidentally were well-known pirates. And the word Viking itself means pirate. I also previously covered the red-skinned Indians of the New World, who painted their white skin red and also used swastikas and serpent symbolism. So it seems that there was an ancient seafaring civilization from the Americas, to the Mediterranean, to Northern Europe, and other places, but I'm running out of time, who revered the goddess in their religion, which today is called pagan, as well as snakes or serpent symbology, which today is vilified as evil and are associated with the color red, which is also the color attributed to the tribe of Dan, whose unique symbol is, you guessed it, the snake. Of course, this story is much older than the Bible, as Plato said while alluding to the colors of Atlantis, and I quote from Critias, the stone which was used in the work they quarried from underneath the center island and from underneath the zones on the outer as well as the inner side. One kind was white, another black, and a third red. It's interesting that the flag of Egypt consists of these same three Atlantean colors of red, white, and black, with an eagle which in pagan times represented Zeus, the planet Jupiter, that has a 12-year orbit around the sun, which is why the zodiac on our modern calendar is based on 12, which was extended to 12 by the ancient Romans when Emperor Augustus added July for Julius Caesar and August, named after himself, the ancient Roman eagle being their emblem, the same emblem as nationalist Germany that rejected the out-of-Africa theory in favor for research into origins from Atlantis, and whose flag, which I'm not permitted to show here, 
use the same swastika as found in Troy or Greece and other places and whose flag also used, you guessed it, black, white, and red. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift. Thank you to those who support me on Patreon. There should be a link below. Kindly share this video if you found it informative. Please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell for updates. I look forward to your thoughts in the comment section. Please have a wonderful week and I hope to see you again soon. One of the most revered movies from Hollywood's golden age was Stanley Kubrick's 1960 epic, Spartacus. Starring the late Kirk Douglas, the film is about a Thracian gladiator, born and raised as a slave, who eventually turns on his owners and goes on to become the leader of a massive slave rebellion in antiquity. While the story has many elements that are commercially effective on the big screen, such as action sequences and drama. The movie also promotes social values that align itself perfectly with Hollywood's social agenda. In fact, one of the founders of the organization known as the Illuminati, Adam Weishaupt, adopted the code name of Brother Spartacus within the order. Karl Marx, Joseph Stalin, and Vladimir Lenin all praised Spartacus as he was a major figure in communist Soviet ideology. And while most people are familiar with and can relate to the story of the underdog that stood up to power, there are some covert elements to the story that are much less known. That said, one in three people in the Roman Republic were slaves. While this statistic might sound like a lot, in a historical context, it really isn't. According to Herodotus, there were seven helots for each Spartan in 479 BC. A helot isn't quite a slave. It's an intermediate status between slaves and citizens. But they were forced to wear humiliating clothing to distinguish them from the Spartan population and were publicly punished through annual beatings to remind them of their servile position. One ancient writer, Plutarch, describes how the Spartans made the helots drunk to show the young Spartans the problem with drinking in excess. He also describes how the young Spartan men could run through the country armed with daggers and murder helots at will. This was intended to terrorize them, to keep them under control. There was no penalty for killing a helot. That said, at its peak, the ratio was probably closer to 20 to 1, that is, 20 people owned by the state to every one free Spartan citizen. Slavery is something that seems to have been present well into prehistory, and in a recent article, an Indian scholar has even suggested that the ancient Sanskrit epic, the Ramayana, features accounts in antiquity of interactions between modern Homo sapiens, the earliest example being Cro-Magnon, and Homo erectus, which is an anatomically correct, archaic species which walked the earth at the same time in certain parts of the world during the late Pleistocene, or Ice Age, as exemplified in this article from the Smithsonian that says, quote, Homo erectus went extinct in Africa and much of Asia about 500,000 years ago, but appeared to survive in Indonesia until about 35,000 to 50,000 years ago, at the site Gangdong in the Solo River. These late members of Homo erectus would have shared the environment with early members of our own species, Homo sapiens, who arrived in Indonesia by about 40,000 years ago. Dr. Rangan Ramakrishnan made the claim in his 10-volume study of the Ramayana and in an article in South China Morning Post was quoted as saying, quote, if one reads the original Ramayana without the influence of succeeding vernacular versions, Vanaras, like Hunaman, are referred to as a distinct species altogether. Like other human species, they speak fluently 
and they inhabit a distinctive culture. In the Hindu epic, the Ramayana, the Vanara refers to a group of ape men living in the forest, and Hunaman was a simian monkey man deity who was revered as being the leader of the monkey people which were used as slave labor to build a bridge known as Rama's Bridge between South India and Sri Lanka. Many people are convinced that the legend is based in reality because of geological evidence that suggests an artificial land bridge was built there thousands of years ago. The bridge is 30 miles long and is mostly submerged now at about 3 feet below sea level, but was reportedly passable on foot until the 15th century when storms deepened the channel. Temple records seem to imply that the bridge was completely above sea level until a major cyclone struck in 1480. On an island in Indonesia called Flores, an archaic pygmy race has been discovered named Homo floresensis, also nicknamed the Hobbit because of its short stature. Standing at about three and a half feet tall and surviving up until at least 17,000 years ago, some people have speculated that this race could have been the fabled monkey people that built the stone bridge. While it did not have a tail, like some depictions of the simian slaves in the Ramayana are depicted in relatively recent art, it could be that the tails were added much later as an artistic interpretation of very ancient oral legends. As none of the people who made the paintings or sculptures actually saw these supposed monkey people with their own eyes and were merely recreating myths that have been passed down over the centuries. It's also interesting to note that the first specimen of Neanderthal, which was discovered in Europe and named after the valley it was found in, but since then numerous other similar fossils of the same or similar species have been unearthed in different parts of the world, such as Asia. Archaeological evidence suggests that Neanderthals lived in South India around 40,000 years ago as well, right alongside modern humans, even interbreeding with modern man and hybridizing into our species. Homo erectus is considered much more archaic than Neanderthal. Archaic just means older and implies more simian features, such as having more prognathism, which is how far the mouth sticks out from the face, and a much smaller brain with a cranial capacity of about 850 cubic centimeters, which is much less volume than Neanderthal, who had on average over 1400 cubic centimeters of cranial capacity. That said, the DNA of both Neanderthal, as well as the much more archaic and primitive species of Homo erectus, have been found in various degrees in modern racial groups as both species were able to produce viable offspring with Cro-Magnon types. While many Neanderthal fossils have been found in Europe and Asia, there is what scientists call an archaic ghost species that has been discovered only in the sequenced genomes of Sub-Saharan Africans. They use the term ghost species because they have not yet identified which hominin it is in the fossil record but genetically speaking, it's at least 1.7 million years removed from modern man, a shocking difference genetically to anybody that has formally studied anthropology. So regardless of who built the bridge, or if the Ramayana epic is even based on real events at all, it is clear that slavery has been around for many millennia, even longer than many of the modern races have been reintroduced to each other during the Holocene, or current age. While there's a lot of propaganda and political agendas behind the stories of how slavery came about, the truth is very different than how it's been portrayed in movies, music, media, and even academia. But some scholars, however, are brave enough to go against the grain and are able to confront reality rather than just embrace popular politics. Henry Louis Gates Jr., is an African-American literary critic, historian, and professor at the Hutchins Center for African and African-American Research at Harvard University. Here's what the Harvard professor has to say about how slavery has come about in modern times. There were African middlemen, and they would fight wars 
with other Africans to enslave them to sell to the white man. Slavery was a huge business for different African kingdoms. You know the story that we got when we were kids that your ancestor was out on one Sunday with his girlfriend and some white man jumps out of the bush and throws a net over him? It's not how it happened. Slavery was big business. Africans sold other Africans to the Europeans. Which brings us back to Spartacus, a slave who was trained to be a gladiator and plotted his escape around 73 BC. About 70 other slaves were part of the plot. Though few in number, they seized kitchen utensils, fought their way free from the fight school, and seized several wagons of gladiatorial weapons and armor. The escaped slaves defeated soldiers sent after them, plundered the surrounding region, recruited many other slaves into their ranks, and eventually retired to a defensible position on Mount Vesuvius. Spartacus and his slave army defeated several attempts by the Romans to police the matter, and grew their ranks to some 70,000 strong. After several major battles, Spartacus's rebel forces were eventually crushed, with Plutarch, Apion, and Florus all claiming that Spartacus died during the battle, but his body was never actually found. In modern times, Spartacus became an icon for communists and socialists. Karl Marx listed Spartacus as one of his heroes and described him as, quote, the most splendid fellow in the whole of ancient history, as Spartacus remained a great inspiration to left-wing revolutionaries throughout history. In ancient Rome, a slave was freed in a ceremony where the slave's head was shaved and a Peleus was placed on it. The Peleus was a brimless felt cap and among the Romans was an emblem of liberty, traditionally made of white undyed wool. Many of these freed men would organize themselves into secret groups with the shared goal of overturning existing power structures to bring about an egalitarian utopia. Much in the same way that Spartacus would share looted spoils with his slave army equally, one of the reasons he was so popular and experienced such rapid growth and expansion. Following the assassination of Julius Caesar in 44 BC, Brutus and his co-conspirators instrumentalized the symbol of the Peleus to signify the end of Caesar's dictatorship. These Roman associations of the Peleus with freedom from rulers seen as suppressive or too powerful was carried forward to the 18th century when the Peleus was confused with the Phrygian cap, then becoming a symbol of those values. For example, it became the symbol of the Masonic French Revolution. After the overthrow of the French monarchy, the French Declaration of Human Rights was said to be officially recorded as the Masonic values of the new French government, whose new motto was freedom, equality, and brotherhood. The official document of the Declaration of Human Rights is guarded by Masonic pillars and contains several occult symbols, such as the all-seeing eye of God and the red Phrygian cap, a symbol of free men or free Masons. I've included a link to a video in the description where this thread of thought is carried out a bit further, involving the covert events that carried France into a war against Germany, again, in the name of freedom, equality, and brotherhood. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. You can find my published books on Amazon. They make a great gift. I would like to thank those who support me through patreon.com. There should be a link below for those who are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you. I also would like to extend my gratitude to anyone who shares these videos. Please remember to hit the like button and to subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comment section, so please leave a comment below. Please have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.